Hey everyone, before we get into the episode, I want to say that there are some Cosmere spoilers in this one, especially for Mistborn Era 1. We also talk about Rhythm of War stuff for like, mm, an hour, uh, but that'll be on screen and in the YouTube chapters if you want to skip that entire hour. Enjoy the episode, because I sure did. Welcome to Shardcast, the Brandon Sanderson podcast. We're a bunch of mega fans giving you the news discussion and of course a whole lot of pins about Brandon's works and the Cosmere. I'm Eric, and joining me is Ian. Hey, I'm your writer. Also joining us is Ben. Ooh. Great timing. Great Hi. timing. <laughs> Great. The man with the water. I'm uh, I'm over We we have to screw up the intro every episode. So this is great. And mm-hmm. also joining us is Daniel Green. How's it going, man? I am doing extremely well. This is the most social interaction I've had in weeks because COVID. <laughs> so it's wonderful. It's great to be here. And you guys are a total delight. It, it's it's <laughs> the you. best part about doing a regular podcast. It's like, oh, wow, I got to talk with humans. This is nice. <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> I think there's actually a statistic out there where more podcasts have started in the last like six <laughs> months than like any other I'm period not ever. At all. I, that <laughs> is not surprising. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I imagine many people know who you are, but do you want to introduce yourself uh, in case people don't know? A professional would have done that. I uh, <laughs> I run a YouTube channel by the name Daniel Green. I talk about the gen- I'm a more general version of Shardcast. It, it feels like here or 17th Shard. Shardcast is that which do you prefer? I've well, heard seven- both. The 17th Shard is our website in Discord, uh, and Shardcast is our podcast, our formal podcast. That is way too long. <laughs> So seven fingers shot. and thumbs thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I, I am a more general, I would say, fantasy version of that, where I'm kind of covering everything for the genre, whether it's book reviews, the news, author interviews, loads and loads of fun. And uh, it's been my full time job for wow, a year and a half now. Whoa, that's a thing. Congrats. That that <laughs> oh, is crazy because wow. uh, we don't mm-hmm. make nearly enough money to pay one of us full time. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, to pay for rent has if YouTube ads, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Oh man, and you you featured uh, our Roshar map uh, the other uh, early in November, and I-, I must say that that was really funny. The event that you clicked on. We'll we'll try and keep this spoiler free for a bit. We'll probably talk about rhythm of war a little bit later, but that that was really funny. <laughs> I'm going to say from the bottom of my heart, I am extremely sorry to the people out there who saw what I clicked on. It was a mistake in editing. I just needed to get like a quick, yeah. here's the map thing, didn't yeah, yeah, pay yeah. attention, and I revealed a big moment. Uh, yeah, and there were so I, many events that yep. didn't mean anything. and It's just like, oh, yeah, that's I, actually a real I stared at a wall for like about an hour and didn't sleep very well that night because I was like, I'm that guy. Who doesn't pay enough attention to his own edits to realize what spoiler he just clicked on? Um, I, I know and I tried to like blur it right away. I tried to put a blur over, and YouTube's editor is like, "Oh, you know, it takes us like um, ten minutes to process your video after you upload it, but to make this edit for you, eight hours." So I kept thinking, like, I, I might just take it down and re-upload it. Yeah. But I was like, but YouTube will make this edit quick. And I kept checking, and I was like, okay. And it was the thing. It was like, I'm sure if I take it down right now, that would right, be right the minute where the edit yeah, kicked in. It wasn't until, like, 4 p.m. Oh, no. that the edit finally kicked in. Oh, no. Which, by that point, everyone's already watched it. And I was just yeah. like, ah, God. I was yeah, gonna say when I was like, oh, and by the way, the edit wasn't where I put it. It only covers like two thirds of the spoiler, which is enough. But I was still like, really? You couldn't get it right? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Uh, I'll say I've had a, I've had experience with that with that editor before. I think there was an an overlady episode, which is where I'm, I'm reading through the the cosmic with my wife, and um, we like left in a line that we left in twice, and someone was like, "Hey, you guys, are, you guys repeated a line there." And I was like, "Oh, I'll just delete that," and then it didn't. And then I just had to go to bed because it was like it's not going to happen today. <laughs> it's it's going to take the whole day to be processed. But uh, I was uh, the editing best. the. Uh, yeah, I uh, I made the I made the trailer for the map, and I remember specifically thinking when showing off events, I like <laughs> non spoilery. I'm like, I think I got Tien was born, and like Kaladin, you know, picks up a spear for the first time or something like that. I'm like, I'm like safe, safe this isn't, this isn't spoilery. <laughs> yeah. I should have just grabbed your trailer and used it, but I was like, I don't know if they'd be okay with me doing that. So the like, answer is yes. The answer is yes. You have fine. permission. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> that's that's fine. So I thought we'd ask to start, and well, this will be less of an interview and more just we're, we're just chatting. Uh, 
But we'll pose it to you first, Daniel. Uh, how did mm-hmm. you discover Brandon Sanderson? So back before I had read even a fraction of a fraction of what I've read now in the genre, um, I made a bunch of Wheel of Time videos. And of course, the fans were like, well, have you read the guy who finished his other work? And I went, no, why would I want to? I'm just a Wheel of Time fan. I don't like fantasy that much. I mean, I've read a few, but I'm not that big a fantasy fan. I was actually, no, this is true. I was much more of a sci-fi guy. I was mm. huge in a sci-fi for us in fantasy. Um, and then they were like, my audience like collectively, cumulatively went, no, you're going to like Mistborn. <laughs> um, and so I picked up Mistborn, and I think the first time I read it, I was like, that was pretty good. And then I finished the series, reread the first book, and I was like, this is great. This is amazing. And then I picked up Stormlight, and then I started doing his one-offs, which he's now not making one-offs because they're sequels to Elantris and Warbreaker in the work, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, after Stormlight uh, 5. Eventually. After Stormlight <laughs> eventually, 5, we'll get there. an Elantris sequel, and Warbreaker sequel will be maybe... We don't know. It's a maybe, yeah. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Sanderson, as someone, it's funny, a lot of the authors I thought were, like, the greatest ever when I started reading more and more fantasy have kind of just fallen, like, ah, oh, actually, they kind of just are average in comparison. But Sanderson has maintained one of the top spots because it's just, you know, you can criticize various aspects of his writing, but in terms of his visions, I don't think there's anyone out there who has clearly more of a strong vision for the worlds they are building than uh, Brando Sando. Uh, this yep, guy, that's right. he world builds. That's, <laughs> he he, he world, world builds. Um, that, that was definitely the thing in like Oathbringer. You're like, wow, we learned so much. We couldn't possibly learn more. And then we get to Rhythm of Worms. Like, oh no, yeah. no, we're, it's definitely book four. And I don't know how like book nine's going to be because wow, there's a lot here. <laughs> there's this, <laughs> there's this dumb spongebob meme where like sandy uh beats up a worm and she's like that wasn't that hard it was easy and then it like zooms out and it was like just the tongue of the actual worm <laughs> and i was like i feel like that's the world building in oathbringer then you zoom out and it's like rhythm of wars <laughs> <laughs> it's like no 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 yeah no. yeah yeah oh man ben how did you discover brandon did you tell us oh the story? yeah we, we, we'll, we'll told just the go story. around let's go so many times people comment saying oh no he's telling the mass effect story again <laughs> Wait, really? I don't even remember those YouTube comments. Excellent. I do. I remember who they are. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it was it was when I was I was also exactly the same. I was a massive fa- sci-fi person. I barely had read any fantasy whatsoever. Um and it was after playing Mass Effect 3 and being so disappointed <laughs> in the ending of Mass Effect 3 that I like I was like I think I googled books with good endings and like and it was like Mistborn the Final Empire it was like top of every list 10 out of and 10 like, timing cool. water timing 10 out of 10 <laughs> yeah. it's going great um, and yeah and so I started reading Mistborn and then uh, and then yeah I just read the whole trilogy because the whole trilogy has a fantastic ending it, it does. and then and then and then yeah just just dived right in started googling about the Cosmere stuff and yeah that's that's and then I've had like a crash course in fantasy since like joining the 17th <laughs> shot because I barely read any of it before. And now I'm like, it's all I read because like I hear about people talking about these great stuff and like, mm-hmm. yeah, I've been enjoying it. It's great. What about you, Ian? Um, So I also got into Brandon by way of Wheel of Time, which like, I have my Wheel of Time books because I got into it my eighth grade year, which was like right around when he died. So it's like I, I got through like I don't know knife um knife of dreams I think yeah so, and th- then I heard out like he died it's like oh that sucks okay what am I going to do now and then I heard about Brendan Sanderson finishing it and I'm like what blasphemy is this who is this person who dares think they can finish the wheel of time and so like I did all this research on him and I'm like reading like the blurbs like description of all the books I'm like all of these sound like super weird like (laughs) there's this cosmere thing that sounds fake like (laughs) and then i read the books and i'm like okay this is my life now i am now (laughs) i have i don't know saying that just i have a distinct memory of when i was looking up like misborn being like Mm -hmm. They eat metal and then it gives them power. It, it does sound so it completely Super insane. <laughs> it's like, what they is really going need on? to not say eat because that implies bite, in my opinion. They need to talk. <laughs> they pill take. They they yeah. swallow something. They drink booze <laughs> and they get power yeah. with the metal. <laughs> I always, I literally like when I first heard it, pictured someone with like a metal bar, and they were just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! See, picture I- like Jaws from 007. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got into Brandon uh, in an. I just saw Elantris in an airport bookstore in I think like 2006, a paperback, and I'm like, oh, multiple viewpoints. That sounds cool. Has an Orson Scott Card cover quote, even though I haven't read Orson Scott Card. I know that name, so sure, I guess. And I read it. <laughs> I, I read it, and I was like, I loved the ending of Elantris. And then there was in the back a preview of Mistborn, and I'm like this isn't an Elantris sequel. And I literally didn't even read the preview for Mistborn. And I'm just like, <laughs> I was so upset that he wasn't writing an Elantris sequel. And then like a year later, I'm like, I did really like that book. What, what, what's happened there? And I read Mistborn and well, Ascension came out by then. I'm like, oh my God, this is the best. I'm so stupid. Uh, and I think I joined <laughs> in like 2007. And uh, so it was fun discovering the Cosmere uh, as it was originally unfolding, where it's like, wow, we don't know anything. Uh, there, there's the there's the inevitable stages of fandom where you like you have what you already love you hear about something else and you're like can't be as good as what i love yeah. i'm skeptical and then you're like maybe you give it a little try and then it becomes your new obsession and it just gets incorporated into your family yeah. and you're like now i know everything that's good and nothing else can possibly <laughs> change this and then you hear something else well, that's sometimes my problem with Brandon writing a new story on a new planet or like a, a ya series that he has it's like I don't know. I don't know if I'm into this, but then it's like, I read it and it's like, okay, yeah, Brandon's really good at this. It's like, mm. yeah, <laughs> this is good. I like this. I like this a lot. Every so often I'll like go back to like, an I'll go and read another series from another author. And I'm like, man, this was really good. I was like, is, is Brandon as good as this? I can't remember. And then I'll pick up a Brandon book again. I'll be like, oh yeah, Brandon's really good. This is, this is really good. <laughs> Well, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Um, have each like have each of you pretty much? I imagine read everything he's written at this point, and several of you said are acting as like beta readers, things behind the scenes. That's true. Has there been other authors that have come close to to worming into a close to your heart, or is it Ooh. just diehard Cosmere all the way? I mean, at this I, point, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I, I, I want the soul, tea. Man. Like I sold my soul at this point. Like nobody. Like my favorite book is still The Hobbit, but that's. Like, you just can't top The Hobbit. Like, I found that, like, as a very small child, it's, like, foundational thing. Like, can't be topped. But, like, Brent is my favorite author. Like, I, I just can't. Nobody else compares. That's there nice. are a lot that, like, I really, really love. Lots of great writers out there. But it's like, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, um, I found none of them have really, have I wanted to... Have I loved as much as Brandon books? But the series that has gotten me recently, it's the only series I've bought special editions other than like these ones, is uh, the Poppy series, mm -hmm. The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. I have adored that series. And like, I it's been those. honestly like, they're really good. In fact, actually, uh, your Daniel, your interview with uh, R.F. Kuang is the first video of yours I, I actually watched. Because um, like, I read it. <laughs> yeah, and like no one, and I, I just found like no one was really talking about it, and so I was like, I was like looking for things, to, and that's how I found like your channel I was like, oh, he's, I did like an hour and long video interview with that. I was like, yes, this, oh, so I watched it. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, the second video I watched then was uh, your your my biggest mistakes video because it had Berserk in the uh, thumbnail, <laughs> and I'm a huge Berserk fan, so I watched it because of that. <laughs> <laughs> And then, I, I, did, I have a fundamental misunderstanding of manga that led to some errors, uh, but I still have not picked up more because I got too much to read and I'm not picking up manga yet. Manga, what, uh, don't someone's going to yell at me for saying it some wrong fine. way. I don't know. That's fine. Yeah, there's such there's such commitments. They're all especially Berserk is like 300 chapters. Like you know, yeah. and you read chapter one. You know, it's. it's... <laughs> <laughs> They're long. I, I did another interview with Rebecca recently where she was talking about like, yeah, like I managed to be a New York Times bestseller. She's winning these awards, all this stuff. And she's like, but, you know, I'm still focusing on my actual full time job. And I was sitting there, I was like, this isn't even your full time job. <laughs> oh my God. She's one of the most impressive people because she's like, yeah, Times named me in like the best fantasy series ever. And I'm just, you know, working on my actual research. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've actually just started uh, Burning God. I'm like, I've, I've got on audiobook and I've like three hours in. I'm like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, oh, that is a series I love. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Butcher, uh, Dresden Files, is probably uh, the other one that I really, really like. It, it's very different me reading other books because in Cosmere, I'm like, 
much more analytical because I'm so into it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I understand what's going on. But then like Jim Butcher, I'm like, my brain is off and I'm here for the ride and I don't even care. Uh, <laughs> and like, I think I earlier this summer in preparation for, you know, the two new books, uh, I think I read Cold Days and Skin Game in a day. And I was like, that was a good day. Was, I'm having fun. <laughs> this, is, this is great. I'm there's a huge overlap I've noticed between Dresden and Cosmere yeah. fans. I, yeah. Maybe it's just because they're both extraordinarily popular, but it seems like to me, even when I go to conventions, if I see like a Cosmere panel, it's the exact same crowd that's going to a Dresden talk. Like they just seem to just pop over. And I, I've never been able to place why they have some similarities, but it's not like I think of one and it seems inexorably tied they're to the other. They're very different books, but yeah, the, there's a ton of overlap. There was a lot of discussion about... uh peace talks and battleground say, when uh on, uh when the most recent ones came out i think on the uh on the discord that was the closest we came to having a, a spoiler policy for a book that wasn't in the cost like a non-branded <laughs> book we're like right we need to tell people they need to um, go elsewhere to talk like they need to go you this need to go to this place channel to talk about, to talk about the dresden <laughs> Because usually we're like, ah, oh, whatever. It's not right. Like, hey, whatever. Big, big. So many people got so excited for two uh, Dresden books coming out, and everyone was like, yeah, and they read them so fast, and now it's like, wait, now we have no idea what the next... Oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like no sign for the next book. Because I haven't read them yet. I, I, I can pace it out a little bit more. <laughs> oh, man. That, it was really great. Uh, it was so good, and I was I just forgot how much I enjoy those books because it's been so long. Because we're so spoiled in the Brandon Sanderson fandom, getting books so frequently and like giant stormlight sized books th every three years, we're we're really spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> well, an amazing thing is like you know we're all I would consider like top one percent of number like reading book wise, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we read books a lot. Most people don't binge them like we do. We're the yeah. Netflix equivalent of just sitting down with a tub of popcorn and a bottle of wine and being like, go. Um, so like a lot of people I've genuinely said, like heard Brandon puts out more books than they can physically read to keep up with. He's actually, because they don't read, they'll, they'll take them a full year to read a Stormlight book. And so the yeah. time they're done with that, he's had like three other books come out and they're like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> they're trying to like move up with him. Um, it's pretty funny that way. It is and, funny. Uh, it's, it, it's, I, I actually got my mom into Mistborn. It's yes. the first fantasy book I've gotten her to like really nice. dig into. And she was like, okay, I need more from him. And I, her, and I, and I handed her uh, Stormlight Archive and she like just picked it up and like felt the way it went, no. <laughs> you should give her Warbreaker. That's what I got. Uh, my mom is currently reading Rhythm of War right now. She's on page 800. Uh, and uh, I got her into Brandon's works uh, through Warbreaker. Cause it's like, it's got, it's got a good romance aspect. Like if you're not into fantasy, I think Warbreaker is a good starting place. <laughs> See, I my, my mom my is just like, "Where's Vin?" <laughs> She's like, "Where's Vin?" I want Vin. It's like, yeah, sorry, uh, see, yeah, that's not I, anywhere. I got, I got my, I got my wife into Cosmere, and that's all I've heard for the last like six months. He's like, <laughs> yeah, that was like, your first yeah, video. I like this book. Yeah, it was our first video. It was Mistborn, and she's like, "Yeah, it's great, but where, where's Vin?" I'm like, "I just want, I just why, why did he kill Vin though?" Oh, she, <laughs> like, she was so upset that Brandon killed Vin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I got my parents into Stormlight because uh, you would listen to the graphic audio edition on on long car rides to when we were going to visit my sister but i didn't tell them how long it was <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like so it's just like listening to it like in three hour chunks over the course of a year but like but now like whenever they go on like trips where where i'm not going it's like they don't listen to it because i have like the cds and it's on my phone so like yeah like we really missed like the story like <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, we, we, so it's like you have to come with us next time <laughs> they're just dragging you along the car rides you don't need to be it's like get in here come on you're like you can put We're it on your phone the dentist. yeah <laughs> my mom i was talking with her after she finished oathbringer and we we like went out to dinner and she's like i have a lot of questions i'm like okay that makes sense uh and she was like there seems like there's a lot of open ends and i'm like yeah it's a 10 book series and she's like oh I thought this was three books. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, mom. <laughs> it's, it's not. Sell it as five. Sell it as yeah, five. That's well, how I've gotten away with it. I yeah. think that will be helpful for people with there being two different arcs. But uh, yeah. I was, and she said, yeah, I don't think I would have gotten into these if I knew how long these were. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> 
I, uh, I've had a lot of luck actually converting Cosmere fans into King fans because once I tell mm. them, like, King's been doing his own Cosmere for decades. That's like, true. he's had a connected universe that takes place and you can follow. And if you're the kind of person who wants to have the cork board with the strings, King is doing it like Sanderson, um, well, or Sanderson like King as he came after. But that's that's actually something where it's like if I if they're like yeah I can stomach a little bit of darker stuff and I'm like how much darker? <laughs> I'm like, how so weird Stephen King get? <laughs> very <laughs> weird. You like unmade and Oathbringer? Like, mm-hmm. uh, but a lot of people. I was like, <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm thinking. Uh, have you read uh, Will White uh, with his like Cradle series and his Elder Empire series? That's kind of another interconnected universe. Yeah. Um, and is that the that one's popping off a lot right now? Yeah, isn't it's, it? it's, it's like indie published, it's really small. But I was just thinking, you know, how you're saying we're spoiled mm. because you know we get books of massive books every three years. I I forgot how quick Will White puts out books. The most recent one came out in November, and then like he put on Twitter, he was like, "Cool, the next one will be out in six months," and it's like, "It will it?" And it's like, "Oh, okay." I forget you don't have to wait years for these books. <laughs> I just imagine like the ghost in the shell gif where like the fingers <laughs> split into like a bunch of more fingers and just start typing. Yeah, that's what we need Brandon to give. Uh, with Stephen King, though, like the thing I love about Brandon is endings. Like his endings are so good. And like Stephen, <laughs> my understanding is that uh, Stephen King puts interesting characters in interesting positions and the endings are not planned. And I don't know if I can emotionally deal with that. <laughs> There's three Stephen King endings. There are brilliant, well-planned out masterpiece endings, and he has a few of those. There is King just decided he's done endings. Occasionally a bomb will go off. People just die. The bad guy wins. Whatever. He's just, bah. And then there's just, okay, Stephen King used to have a drug problem, and it shows endings. Uh, those are also uh, prevalent in some of his work. Uh, but I think that's actually one of the things I like about King. Um, he's extraordinarily unpredictable. You do not that's know where true. he's going to go. Uh, it's why actually the biggest author collab I've pushed for for years is I want a King Sanderson collab because I think it would just be wow. so complimenting each other's weaknesses and that's who knows true. where it would go. Wow. They might get in a fist fight before they finish writing it, <laughs> but it true. could be a really neat experience. Wow. Um, even a novella, I just want to see him do some kind of collab uh, on. I, I want could collab novellas. Very well. Yeah, I was gonna say because like you could tell Brandon wants to write a horror, horror novel. Like you can tell he's he's got some creepy ass bits in his books. I was like, I was like, I reckon he, he'd be up for a horror novel easy. Yeah. I just imagine Sanderson like, here's my idea where I'm gonna take it, and then Stephen King comes in and is like, all right, we're gonna go in this direction. They're gonna take, they're he's gonna like, cool. flip that around, and then they're gonna die. Cool idea. Let's make it weird. Because because <laughs> like Brandon books, you probably know he's not gonna Game of Thrones main characters. You know, like he's yeah. not going to like kill people in like, just, uh, and, like and if he, right? Hmm. Yeah. If he does, he's not going to do it in an over the top, grotesque, heart ripping, <laughs> yeah. brutal fashion. They're going to yeah, have right. like a dignified death that's right. like satisfactory as a hero. Um, he, he's not going to have them just walk in the room and then get capped. <laughs> <laughs> like happens with so many other authors. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, Daniel, I am very curious because you are so well read. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Cosmere as a whole? Like with the connections between Brandon books. So for me, the Cosmere is one of the most impressive executions of a concept a lot of people have tried before. I mean, we talked, we just mentioned Stephen King has something similar going on, but Stephen King's is not nearly as interconnected as overtly. I've met diehard Stephen King fans who didn't realize it's connected. You will realize the Cosmere is connected, but it never feels cheap. It's never like the MCU where it's just like, ha reference, you see the thing, the gauze, Asgard, like he's never doing that. He's managed to strike an extraordinarily delicate balance of making sure you're aware of what's going on, but leaving it a puzzle so that you got to dig deeper. Um, you need to read everything, figure it out, make the connections. I hope he never goes full Avengers like, oh, Vin and Kaladin or F- no, I don't want that. I want it to stay fairly segmented and maybe do a story down the road down the road that kind of brings it more together. Um, so I, I'm I'm hesitant to say like it's this flawless masterpiece before the full tapestry is unveiled because, you know, it could completely fly off the rails. We don't know for sure. But as of right now, it feels like an extremely solid base. Like there's no weak 
con Cosmere connection I've found. There's nothing that feels uh, lazy or like last minute. It's always deeply ingrained. And I specifically remember the first time I noticed a Cosmere connection and went, oh my God, and had to like do a whole lot more research. What, Granted, what I was had your first like, one? Uh, well, it was... Was uh, sword. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yep, yep, yep. Name, name of the Nightblood. sword. Nightblood. Uh, Nightblood. Thank you, Nightblood. I, yep. I wanted to say Shade Smar is the name of the sword. No. <laughs> <laughs> Angry so, comments are uh, already uh, typing. No, just kidding. Uh, going insane. <laughs> this guy doesn't um, know anything. <laughs> uh, so people have told me the Cosmere existence connected, but I, sure. I hadn't been told any like specific look out for this. And as soon as that popped up, I was like, Whoa. Stormlight, <laughs> oh, yeah, like I went nuts. Um, yeah. And so for me, I, I enjoy that. I wish there, like, I personally like would die to see a, a magic system carry over more overtly than we've seen. Like we've seen some stuff with wit where it's kind of like, oh, okay, there's, uh, we've seen that in other worlds. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I personally am like, I want more, but I know the balance he struck is right for what he's going for. So I'm having to like reel in my greedy goblin and <laughs> be like, <laughs> just let him, just let him go. Have faith. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny. It's also made it like even the, the, the Cosmere books I don't love the most. I still appreciate more because I know they're a part of this bigger image. And I know he's working with an angle that's making every story he writes more difficult because he has to take 10,000 things more into account than your standard author does who's cranking out a 700 page fantasy standalone that has nothing, no other baggage to carry along. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's something that I'm hesitant to give firm opinions on beyond what I've said. Because again, I feel like we are very early on in the Cosmere. Yes. People like to think that it's like this big thing already unveiled, but in reality, like I think there's so many cards that are still held so close to his chest that we have no inkling of. And I'm really excited to get there. Mm. Um, I'm, I have a theory that yes, the Stormlight is presented as like the biggest chunk of the Cosmere. It's this huge thing, but in 10 years, I think there could be another equally large series that bubbles up that's much more close to the center of all things. Um, it's It feels like I've always compared authors to boxers. I feel like Sanderson's only got his first couple rounds in, and we're going to have a lot more to come. And I don't, I don't see any sign of him getting knocked out. No. I also don't want, like, an Avengers thing, but you know what I would love? I'd love, like, an alien invasion story where the aliens are from other planets. Like, that sounds incredible. That'd be, cool. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and I don't know if you... Brandon did a reading at the Rhythm of War release party where he was reading from mm -hmm. a Sixth of the Dusk sequel. I don't know if you've read that story. Uh, but it's in the far I'm future. Uh, it... It it talks about some things, and we won't we won't really talk about it. But he he it's said very spicy. He said like <laughs> cultures will clash eventually. It's not going to be like oh yeah, all like the main oh, yeah. heroes and stuff. But like we will see cultures clashing, and I'm like, good, that sounds awesome. And like magic's clashing, yeah. I'm like, I am into this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's compared it. He said it's more going to be more like Star Trek than Avengers, where we're going to have one point of view going Perfect. into the space age, and there's going to be things going on that we recognize mm -hmm. I, i've heard him make that uh comparison and I, I i love that idea uh to me that actually makes a lot more sense for what he's going it feels much more natural because if he did jump to an avengers type scenario to me that would just feel inorganic it, it, would, it would feel uh forced mm -hmm. having this more star trek approach one it, it leads to where i actually think the story should go like if you think doing a dumb you know easy example if dalinar met kelsier and they had to like go for a similar objective those two would get along <laughs> you haven't paid attention to those characters because they would True. not at all not at all um it's amazing to me how many people read the mistborn trilogy and they're like oh these good guys are so great and wholesome and i'm like are you <laughs> paying attention vin murders people who are just doing their job like all the time like she's just like guard standing there i'm gonna put my forehead through your face and kelsier like, just, enjoys it not, <laughs> yeah. yeah oh yeah <laughs> kelsier, kelsier is up, like he comes up oh, with yeah. this big plan of like how to how to like accomplish their goals and his his role of the plan is i'm gonna murder people randomly for fun and you guys do the hard bit <laughs> <laughs> it's true though that is how that Kelsier, goes Kelsier comes up with plans to minimize survivors like that's his approach he's um, surviving so not think, other people you know, he would exactly and so if you think he would get along with like Shalon no 
they would not. Um, and so that's actually where I think like this, there's actually different moralities throughout the Cosmere. Um, we've seen different cultures literally have different ideas of what's right and wrong, uh, which I think is one of the small details that as I picked up more and more on, I, I appreciate because you have like, I would say the more the you know, typical heroes that have a traditional sense of fantasy justice. Uh, I think uh, Warbreaker, Ember Soul, uh, Elantris have much more of a traditional uh, fantasy sense of right and wrong. Whereas I easily see, you know, Vin in another story is a villain. I mean, my God, geez, if you are from the perspective of some guy making his day in the world and you're just all of a sudden there's this woman crashing through your cart of cabbages to throw out an avatar <laughs> reference, you're not a fan yeah. of her. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't just go through, she wouldn't just smash through your cabbages. She might mistake you for a guard, kill you and not think about it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, can we, I, I want... You said something, and I think we need to talk about Rhythm of War. So we'll put Rhythm of War in, on screen, sure. and we'll also put chapters. So if you want to just skip paths, Rhythm of War stuff. So, did, did, did you notice Kelsier in Rhythm of War? Daniel? Ooh. No? He doesn't appear on screen. What, what he doesn't missing? appear yeah. on screen. He's Thydekar. Okay. The, the leader of the Ghost Bloods <laughs> is Kelsier. Is Kelsier. He's the Lord of Scars. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Lord of Scars. So when you uh, said Shalon says... interacting with Kelsier, I was just like, yeah, that is very plot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm so glad we got this on camera. Holy crap. <laughs> Because he has an affliction similar to Harold's because he's a cognitive shadow. He came back, right? And he, mm -hmm. yeah. And he Wait, meddles so in things all me... the time, right? And the message Wit has Shalon say is like, don't make me come to your plan up again. Because we <laughs> yeah, saw him I'm... beat up in Secret History. So Sanderson's going to pull a double whammy. <laughs> he's going to have Terevangian killed very offhandedly like Odium was. And then Kelsier's the main <laughs> villain of the story. <laughs> I mean, Kelsier could be the main villain of the Cosmere. That's plausible. He very mm -hmm. well could. So yeah, he mm. he he will be a villain. So I just we we had to talk about that right now because I yeah. just <laughs> when, when you said Kelsier and Dalinar, I I, I assumed blew my mind. <laughs> I assumed you knew. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, that it's was like, just a very happy accident. <laughs> Kel Kelsier is the embodiment. Is you either die a hero or you live long enough to become a villain? Yeah, so it's like, and he, he did die both. a hero, and he came back as a villain. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. That's a perfect way to put it. I mm -hmm. wow. See, that's okay. That's a textbook <laughs> example of like. Why I wish I could go back to the simpler times in my channel where I've read like four series and I read them again and again and again because like I'd catch that right away. But now I'm reading like Greenbone, Witcher, you know, trying to yeah, get catch yeah, up on yeah, Forgotten yeah. Realms and keep track of these indie guys. And so I'm trying to sit here and like catch all the references in Rhythm of War. Like my eye starts twitching and I'm like, wait, when's Geralt going to show up? No, wrong universe. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I mean, that that's totally fair. But we, we did need to blow your mind there because like. Please, thank you. <laughs> It was so on topic, but like, man, race dying? Insane. Like how to, like book four? It was just totally crazy. Mm -hmm. see, totally didn't see okay. that. Okay. No. Book four may have done the best job of setting up the final book yes. to a series in the sense mm -hmm. of this is like the last of this leg I have come across in a long time. I wish there had been more sustenance within the book for me to enjoy it on its own. Like I had issues in that sense, but in terms of getting me ready for book five, I am on pins and needles now, and I'm thankful that Sanderson does write at the pace of like a Stephen King because I don't have to wait Ten so years. long. I mean, if you, yeah, <laughs> that would be the worst. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, I would be. Well, also like a part of that is I'm afraid of fans figuring stuff out. I'm always annoyed when like fans genuinely figure like because certain books have been out for so long, people just predict the rest of the series because they put all these well laid eggs together that the authors weave in. And it's kind of like you come across like, yeah, that, I know phrasing. Oh. <laughs> no, I was thinking with, about something else, actually, that we'll talk oh, about okay. a bit. But like they, they, they figured out, I always come across those because I'm, you know, my job is to keep up to date with fandoms are doing and it ruins it. But like knowing we only have like a year or so until like we're going to get another Cosmere entry, it prevents that from happening, in my opinion. It makes it so there's new information always coming, which recontextualizes stuff and makes it so the fans are kind of stuck 
constantly on their toes. And I just love that part of this community because it's like, what is going to come next? And I'm always convinced we're going to find out new things that are in Well of Ascension because of information we get in book seven. Yes. That's going to be like, oh, that actually is a reference because we know, you know, Brandon is kind of crazy and he's putting that stuff in there yeah. that far in advance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the thing is, is that Brandon sometimes trolls people. Uh, and so the example that I was thinking of, uh, and I think Ben and Ian already know what I'm going to talk about, is uh, mm -hmm. you, you remember that black sphere that Gavilar gave Zeth at the, the beginning? And so in Oathbringer time, Brandon was just like, you'll know what the black sphere is after Oathbringer. It's what the book implies it to be. And then you read Rhythm of War, it's like, anti void what how would he like how would we possibly have known that before this book? he said it's what you think it is <laughs> it's like, that's what he said <laughs> so like he does give us a lot of information but i think sometimes he's just really enjoying trolling us but also on the topic of like fans figuring things out ahead of time the way brennan writes like oftentimes it's still satisfying because it's like the the whole reveal with like the Radiance Bren being in on the re recreants. Like, that was our... We, we, we kind came of, up with it. We, we came up with that theory, like, shortly after Oathbringer, because, like, it was the only thing that made sense. Mm -hmm. And then we got that reveal, and it was like, like, we... Well, it's like, of course, that's what happened. But the way he wrote it, it was just like, this is so awesome! <laughs> <laughs> well, that just comes down to quality. Like, if the story is written well, love, you don't care if it's predictable. Like, Star True. Wars is not unpredictable, but people are going to enjoy the original Star Wars movies. I add the original to avoid angry comments. That's uh, right. <laughs> because they're just well-told, interesting <laughs> space operas. And it's, it's actually, I feel like I'm the only person in the world who does not like the, sh the Mandalorian. I'm so bored by season two. I feel like oh, I'm the really? only one who's just not enjoying uh, it. I'll but... see you guys later. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of this. <laughs> I haven't seen any of it, so I don't know. I haven't seen it okay. yet either. But like, I think it's the best me, thing since the original trilogy. So, yeah. I like that Sanderson, uh, <laughs> I like that Sanderson seems to really keep his ear to what uh, his audience is doing in that sense because he can, you know, incorporate ideas or, uh, well, work with them and i there's this well-known thing that uh jordan when he was writing wheel of time he would be reactionary uh when he saw his fans predict something right he'd be like oh i gotta i gotta fix yeah. that i gotta change something mm -hmm. i don't feel like sanderson does that and that's something i really appreciate tell the story you want to tell it shouldn't matter if someone predicts it it sucks for us if someone predicts it but it shouldn't change your vision um i'm, I'm really big on that authors need to tell the story they want to tell regardless of outside influences i, I don't yeah. like subverting expectations just because fans uh, get it it's like yeah. Some will, some won't, and uh, if it's subtle foreshadowing, then it's like it, it, cool. I think I remember him talking about this after the Game of Thrones uh, final season, where he was saying he's like, if if your fans guess a twist before it's coming, don't change the answer. Give them the answer they've guessed, because then you give them the satisfaction of not only the people who haven't guessed it get a cool twist, but the people who have guessed it get the satisfaction of knowing that they guessed the twist. Like, you know, you shouldn't let that affect you, kind of thing. Absolutely. And there's another angle to that where it's like, OK, if you've made it so people are getting the twists, great. You have smart readers and you've done a good job of foreshadowing what is to come. That's actually a part of storytelling. If you set something up right and you've aligned the stars, so to speak, to like put your audience in a direction, that's quality writing. Um, don't get upset because some people predict it. And you have to remember, as you said, just because some people predicted it doesn't mean most fans see it coming because you're yeah. you're looking at the forums, which is the mega fans who are thinking about it all the time. Yes. You know, your average guy who's just reading it on his way home to work who's not part of any of this he doesn't know yeah. and so you're you're writing for him as well mm -hmm. hmm. it's like the oathbringer twist about humans not being native to roshar to like us on the 70th child. that was like super obvious that was like something we've known yeah, forever that's true. <laughs> and so like and then we read and then you read comments and it's kind of like oh yeah that wasn't already known like that was new information in this book yeah, but, you know, that's that's almost becoming a cliche now to have like, oh, the humans are the invading monsters all along. Like we've seen that. I mean, I think the most well-known example is Witcher as a part of its lore is that the, the humans were brought right. in and they're the invasive species is the way I'm going to put it. Um, but, uh, but you know. With, with Roshar, they're especially invasive because they don't look like anything on Roshar. So it's like <laughs> you can kind of figure it out, right? It's like, ah, oh, they're yeah. not crabs. They're, right. <laughs> they're, they're not crab people. Everything else, super spiny. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Wonder what's different. 
Uh, but he, that, that's actually the kind of logic I appreciate from Sanderson as well. I mean, he is a very, not scientific, but logic driven writer. Um, everything has a reason, uh, not to sound like George Lucas, but it, it, there's a rhyme to it. There's, there's always a flow and the storytelling will unveil that information very naturally. He has his exposition dumps that come from, you know, his Jordan influence and all that. But I would say he's even maybe a little bit better than Jordan at actually putting it in the narrative, how you get the information you need. Um, Jordan was just like, all right, here's a curtain. Now let's talk about this. Like, <laughs> Sanderson doesn't do that. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but is, in terms of, I actually have a question for you guys. In terms of the Cosmere, it, do you have any predictions now on the podcast that you've come to that you're pretty confident? Okay, this is where this will be the next big Stormlight or you know Cosmere twist. What are your big ideas right now? <laughs> what you don't want to watch our uh, five to six hour <laughs> rhythm of war reactions? I can't, I can't imagine <laughs> that you wouldn't have enough time to do that in your busy schedule. Uh, I, I apologize. No, no, for, that, you know, a quick that, that kind of version. <laughs> I'm going to try and think of one which I haven't said on another podcast. Uh, oh, I thought hmm. you were going to say the the baby theory. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll give my child champion theory. Um, so, so, Daniel's face you know makes great. The <laughs> comments hate this theory, baby too. Yoda showing up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, at the end of uh, Rhythm of War, uh, Odium and Dalinar agree to have a battle of champions, fight to the death. Um, and then when uh, Taravangian takes up Odium, <laughs> right, Taravangian looks at the, agree like, the, yeah. the agreement, what he's agreed to, and he's all like, huh, and like notices something. Uh, interesting and i think what he's noticed is the fact he can pick a child as his champion that dalinar's not gonna kill and we have little baby gavinor his his nephew grand nephew grand nephew and i'm like i reckon he might pick gavinor that odium might pick gavinor as his champion and then dalinar's gonna turn up at the top of the tower and not gonna be able to kill him there's there's that's also, my there's also a death yes. rattle from the first book that uh that Ben based this theory off of. Yes, I forgot to mention. There's a yeah. There's like a, one of the little prophecies the in the, from the first book has a. I hold a suckling child in my arms and a knife to his throat and know that everyone in the world wants me to uh, move my hand or whatever. So yeah, you I said a uh, child is. like baby champion, and I just pictured like Teravangian showing up and like putting a baby on a rock and be like you won't kill that, <laughs> you won't kill that. I win. <laughs> very, <laughs> like, very <laughs> like, basically the where did you get that baby? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's like I just gave him some candy. Just said, it's like I just gave him said, "Hey, do you want to be my champion? Here's some candy." And the baby was like, "Heck yeah!" And I'm like, there you go, it's a baby. <laughs> now the funnier like step to that is Dalinar's like, "All right, <laughs> Blackthorn time, let's go." He's like, I've done this before. <laughs> it's true. It's true though. I think my big theory at the moment is that. Two of the unmade, Siana and Baido Mishram, are going to like defect from Odium, like join like the humans and become new Bondsmith's friend. So now we'll have five Bondsmiths. Like the sibling and the Stormfather. Like the sibling and the Stormfather. Make your make your case. I mean, I just think it's it would be cool. Like, cause like we we've already seen like Siana is like not totally on board with Odium. Like she is like we're actively working to create like like corrupted radiant spren but like not to work for odium and then like baedo mishram like we got some like juicy lore about her in this book where like she was like trying to be her own god because like she kind of like took over for odium like when during the false desolation that's right when like odium was still sealed away and like her ceiling kind of like screwed everything up on roshar it's like whoever frees her like is going to be important because it's like which side frees her frees her from her imprisonment is going to be important. So it's just like, but it, but also it's like the Stormfather is associated with Stormlight, sibling is associated with Life Light, uh, no, Tower Light. There's so a like lot of lights. The, there's a lot of light. <laughs> a lot. So it is like Baido Mishram provided Void Light to the singers, and it's like Siana is like has the in with War Light. So it's like it's just like. Come on. Yeah, because like Warlight, the Honor, Odium. That's Light. convincing. How, how much do you remember of Bai Domishram, Daniel? Like, like real talk, because she's not mentioned much. Uh, it's enough to know who she is 
and what like what side she's on. But if you were going to be like, what's her hair? I'm going to be like, <laughs> well, we no. don't know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Bottom Mishram's like one of my favorite characters, like since Oathbringer. There's just like three epigraphs about her. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm writing her copper mine article. So I love right. her a lot. And she's and I'm so I'm I'm so excited. No, I, I really do. Like after Oathbringer, I was like. I like woke up a few times at night. I'm like, wow, bottom shrimp's cool. That that legitimately happened. No joke. Uh, so like more bottom shrimp stuff. Book five. Let's just, go. Just sitting up. Bottom shrimp's pretty cool. Well, like there's a thing that says that bottom shrimp was the hi- high princess of the Voidbringers. So I'm like, did this unmade order fused around? Like that's insane. Like if that's true, like then she is probably the biggest badass ever, and we're screwed. And so I'm so excited to see. Shalon Hunt by Demetrium. Mm-hmm. Book five. Well, that, that goes into the whole, we're going to have, I think, so Sanderson likes to pull his little rug out. You know, he likes yes. to be like, oh, we're, we're going this way. No, we're not. We're over here. Race is dead. What's I up? think, so we, <laughs> at the beginning of the series, Voidbringers were painted one way. Now they're kind of being painted another. I think we're going to see, not like a flip back, but like a flip up. I, I have this, that's my theory, is that the, the so, mm-hmm. He's trying to make us comfortable going like, oh, yeah, the Voidbringers are actually here. And then in the next book, it's going to be like, ah, no. So I, I'm curious how that's going to play out. Um, I just have this feeling that the portrait we're getting is the the wrong angle. And we're going to get the true angle soon. Um, and that actually, I think, will be a big part of the kickoff for the next leg. I think it's actually going to go based off the fact that's why he's suddenly making it so we're in their culture. We're suddenly a part of, you know, getting the full picture of the world so that once we get some piece of information, it will really flip the whole narrative direction. And I think that's why Tara Vangian took over as the main villain to begin the course correction of, okay, you thought it was going to go in this typical, almost like I don't know, it was like, felt more like it was going in the direction of like crippled God Malazan for me. And it's going to actually go over here. Um, Because that's the biggest, that's actually why I'm so anticipating book five. Book four to me felt like someone just grabbed the wheel and flipped it and just went on that way. Yeah. yeah, And everyone in first class fell off their fancy (laughs) tables. Um, I uh, always another secret. Yeah. I felt like every time I finished before uh, before this one, this one I didn't get this the feeling from. Um, but every Stormlight book I read it, and I was kind of like, "Man, all my questions were answered. I can't think of any mysteries left to solve." <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, and then every book after like answers questions I didn't even realize were there. And then this this book did not give me that feeling. This book leaves a lot of uh, questions to be answered. But uh, yeah, he does that. He's very good at doing that. I do want to point out, Sanderson has created a world where mankind has mastered flight before rubber tires, and I think that is impressive. I like that, and it's believable. We don't have rubber tires, that is but true. we have flight. That's they actually invented, very believable. They invented nuclear weapons before electricity. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an interesting society. <laughs> <laughs> the Cosmere is going to be more and more thought of as sci fantasy as a yes. whole. I mean, there's oh, already yeah. so many. Like, it, you have your de- just 100. It's fantasy, like Mistborn, but Stormlight Archive is clearly already stepping into that sci fantasy ter- ter- turf. Um, and from yeah. there, it's just going to roll more and more. So, um, and I think once we see sequels to Warbreaker and Elantris, could be even more inklings of that. Mm-hmm. And it's just going to be one of those big Sanderson webs where he slowly weaves himself into this next stage because that's just what he's really good at. He's a giant spider, just getting it all ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it's like the last Mistborn trilogy is space opera. Like it, yeah. it's like that's so cool. Hustle. But hmm, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Like, I talk with my fiance Jess, about uh, the books all the time. She and I were imagining, like, Teravangian would just show up at the top of the tower, and Dalinar would be like, whoa, what are you doing here? You're the champion? And Teravangian's like, that's not what's going on here. And it's just going to be, like, a total, <laughs> like, it, it'll be crazy. Uh, I don't know who the- Teravangian holds up a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that part. I don't know about that part. But yes. I feel like I've converted Daniel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I really like that theory. We, you you got to read the death rattle. The death rattle is really good. I, I feel like the deal Teravangian made with Odium to like protect Carbranth, like that could maybe be Teravangian's undoing. Maybe. Because mm-hmm. like that was that deal and the ah. power still bound by it. Right. Mm hmm. I mean, it's going to be pretty clear that Terrence Vangian's undoing is going to be his hubris, right? I mean, the guy, <laughs> he thinks he's pretty great. 
So he's going to oversee something. That's going to be his undoing. He's going to, oh, I've, I'm the smartest man alive. There's no <laughs> way you could possibly, and Adolin just punches him in the face. Uh, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, but then Adolin will actually have a purpose to his existence. Uh, oh, we, we actually do got to talk about uh, the more rhythm of war stuff and your your thoughts uh, on that. Like, it's fair. I'll go, I'll get into Adolin. I'll get into him because I'm, I am aware of, of the concept of a supporting character, right? That's <laughs> I've never read a supporting, a supporting character supporting before. Character. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, like they need to still have like their own many things going on. And while Adolin has certainly had those, they've never been like cathartic to me. I've never experienced mm. something with Adolin where I'm like, yeah, I kind of am getting there with his friendship with Kaladin because it's such a like weird brotherly dynamic i really like how he's kind of like calvin you're sad get your ass out of bed like that <laughs> works for me and yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of like giving me like some okay there's some purpose to you here i like that because i'm a very relationship driven uh reader very much so which i think is again one of the reasons i uh had a couple more issues with them a war because like some of my favorite relationships they were just pulled apart like navani right. and dalin are hardly interacted yeah, that I'm is like, true oh, I yeah. like him, though. Yeah. it's a little game of thrones and it's cool get make a smoochy smoochy um <laughs> but, i'm sorry it is weird that he's with his brother's widow i'm it, not it gonna is, I hate look the people it is it's not weird. weird yeah it is it's weird <laughs> it like they work <laughs> but it's still kind of weird you know if you like really I think about them, them. Yeah. it's great but it's odd. Like if they were like, "Hey, uh, nice to meet you. How did you two meet?" Well, funny story. <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a Brandon book without a weird brothers, one woman in the situation kind of. Or in, sorry, in Warbreaker, it was sisters and one dude. You know, it wouldn't be a Brandon novel without a uh, without a weird kind of uh, sibling relationship like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Adolin, especially in this book, it was just a great example of how, like, I was really pumped to see him do something. I was like, all right, he's doing this trial. It's kind of clashing with, like, a lot of people are like, oh, honey to him all the time. So is he really equipped to do this? But he was he was working it. But then it came down to someone else's big reveal. Someone else is stepping up. And yeah, he helped build that. But it, it just didn't provide me enough for him. And I like Adolin is a concept. I like his personality quite a bit. So I'm just like, come on, mm. give me. It's. It, I feel like he's a pistol that keeps dry firing, and I'm like, give me something here. And I'm afraid mm. to look down the barrel. Um, <laughs> that's that's how a, I kind of feel about he's him. He's a support character, and his arc is just being the best support character for all the <laughs> other characters. You know, now, he's helping Myra along. He's helping Kishalan along. You know, I, I I agree. But like, let's look at the best support characters, like Sam. Right? Let's just look at Sam, the greatest support character to ever live. Absolutely. The reason he works so well is because he ended up being such a part of why they won, why they were, and he actually had his own personality that made sense, his own arc that built to that. Whereas Adolin, it feels a little misdirected. It feels like, why is he suddenly doing the few good men trial scene? That's not him. Like it, it feels a little, he's left mm. foot over here. He's right foot over here. He's the soldier. Why is he doing, why is he going, you can't handle the truth or no, he'd be, <laughs> he'd be Tom Cruise in that situation, but no, yeah, no, yeah, he yeah. would be Jack Nicholson in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's kind of my concern is I really want to see him find a firm footing of here's my purpose, what I've built to my payoff. And I just, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I really hope we get it in the next book. Can I sell you on my Stormlight back half theory for Adolin? That's going to yes. be really awesome. Ooh. So so my I've always thought that book five is going to be really bad. And the reason why we're going to have a new cast in the back five is because a lot of our cast is going to die. It's not going to go well, mm -hmm. uh, which will be a real bummer ending if we have a Stormlight break for like 10 years or like five years or so. That'll be fun. But so <laughs> I... <laughs> It occurs to me that Adel, like if Dalinar and Kaladin die, okay, let's let's just go with that premise for a second, uh, which is not depressing at all. Um, <laughs> Adolin, like he has that clash with Dalinar, but he's not going to be like his own person until Dalinar's out of the way. So like if Dalinar and Kaladin die, and then we see Adolin 10, 15 years in the future, being just like badass king of your theory, uh, being like seeing how he's being his own type of leader. That's not Dalinar, but like trying to find his way. Cause I feel like that's, that's what he's struggling with. Like in Oathbringer, 
He's like, wow, Shadesmar, that is crazy. I did not know that this was here, and I am not prepared for that, and I'm going to do my best, but, like, I'm really out of my element. And I really liked that in Oathbringer. Mm-hmm. Like, here, he's like, no, I'm going to do... I'm going to succeed on a mission and I'm going to do it my way, that sort of thing. Uh, and like him helping Maya, like that's why it worked for me because he is so helping Maya and everything uh, mm-hmm. that it did work even for me. But he, like, I, I can kind of see what you're saying, but I, I really liked Adel and stuff in, in this book. So, but seeing him in the back half where the other characters are out of the way and then he can be more of like new Dalinar and we see that difference and, just seeing him be a, a different kind of badass. That sounds awesome. And then he has this like world hopping wife or something doing like crazy Cosmere <laughs> stuff. Like that sounds awesome to me. See, I, my current prediction is Adolin dies. Uh, that's my current mm. prediction is he is a death that then motivates Kaladin. That's mm. my thoughts Ooh. there. And I also think Kaladin has a good chance of dying. And then they uh, become the Avengers because Adolin dies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know for sure Dalinar's going to die. Like, I would put money down on that. Uh, I think Navani's oh, going to live. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Navani lives. Uh, I think Adolin dies to motivate Kaladin, and then Kaladin dies after accomplishing something. Uh, okay. But, and that's why I'm 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 ready to be disappointed with Adolin overall because I think he's just <laughs> going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I am. I yeah. think he's like book five is going to be like him and Kayla Kaladin becoming better and better friends. Like, oh, Mr. Frodo, not really, but a little. And then <laughs> Adolin's gonna die, and Kaladin's gonna go, my brother, and then he's gonna you know do other stuff. That's my general prediction. That's possible. Uh, granted, again. I don't reread these books religiously. I'm reading, you know, I'm, I don't have as much behind the scenes look, uh, but I, I think Adolin, I, if it was a comedy series, he'd fall and just like impale himself <laughs> on his sword, but he's, uh, he's going to go out epically. But uh, I, I predict a Leonidas type ending for Adolin. That's my, that's my mm. theory right now. Yes. I, my personal theory is that he is going to fully reawaken Maya and become a, a radiant that way and be the first one to do that oh i i, I agree with that i think that will happen he'll just then die that's my <laughs> what a depressing <laughs> end for maya it's like hey i'm back oh yeah yeah rip that guy oh, oops <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> that's plausible though like i i can see the argument that it's like oh i mean adolin would be a good character for that if, if that almost feels like too obvious. I, I know like Brandon's usually doesn't like 4D chess everything, but then like race dies. So then I'm like, I don't know. But I mean, Dalinar, I think, I think he's going to die or he'll lose and be a rampaging fused across the Cosmere. And like that is a thing that can happen. He could be a villain in the back five. Like That sounds awesome. <laughs> I would I would call that a death. I would call yeah, that yeah, a yeah, death yeah. of his original yeah. character. Yeah, right. Um, but I also think his death could be used as a great way to set up Shallan for the second half because I think she's going to live, and I think she's I think going she's to be. Gonna an, I my prediction is second leg is going to be a lot darker, and it's going to be like, oh, Shallan is heartbroken. The other personalities are completely almost taken over. She doesn't come out much anymore. Like that kind of setup. Oh, um, you think that's where, where Shallan's just, where, going? I, I think she's going dark. I think Shalon's going dark. I, I feel um, like this that's... book was dealing with the personality thing, and so I don't actually know where Shalon's going, but I don't think there's going to be new uh, alters or anything. Hmm. Hmm. I'd say for, for my, I... my prediction for Shalon is she's most likely to become a world hopper out of all the characters. She's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, like, uh, just, yeah, like, for sure. them, she's the most likely the one we're going to see in other books in the future. That's you true. Know? Sanderson often, you know, people talk about he's just, he's not as dark as a lot of these other guys, and I think there's something in him that's just like, all right, like we'll we'll see, and <laughs> that's going to be the second leg. A hundred percent. I I have a feeling the reason. So Brandon doesn't write bad endings. He he I th- he just he, I don't think he likes writing bad endings. He doesn't want to write bad endings. Um, and so I think the reason he's got two five book arcs is because he wants to write a bad ending for the five the first five books, so that. But then eventually he'll write his good ending, but he got his he's got his bad ending in there in book five. He's got a know. good Empire Strikes Back, like there. But yeah. yeah. It's gonna be really weird. I don't think it'll be a bad ending. I yeah. I think it'll be an ending that just leaves everyone going like, oh, I have to go and I have to go on. Like I think it's going to be it's going to conclude. Like there's going to be tremendous sacrifice. There will be a victory at high cost, and then we pick up with a 
continuation of the threat. It won't be a, I'm referencing Stephen King's It, where Pennywise is defeated once, it allows a break, but then we have to deal with it in the real sense, a much more, okay, this mm -hmm. is going to happen again. I see a elongating of a similar arc to try and take it on from there. And I absolutely see Shallan of all the characters prevalent or present to be someone who could be a mentor to bring up a new cast to be get ready like Kaladin couldn't do that Kaladin's not the guy to show up and be like let's get ready guy no <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think uh I don't think Sanderson will be able to resist the heartbreak that he'll put be able to put in his readers by killing Kaladin and Sil. I think he will he he has Ooh, to do you're that. gonna you're oh. gonna kill off Sil too oh, all right God. Either yeah, that or she's losing her memories and she is left wondering and we get that heartbreaking perspective where she's just sad and she doesn't know why. Uh, yeah, I think he's wow. going to hurt you. I think Sanderson's going to hurt Ooh, his audience. Like That's that. my prediction. I love you. It was a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> In my head, I've kind of, I'm like, Ooh. yeah, Kaladin, if Kaladin dies, yeah, that's probably going to happen. I hadn't even thought of Syl. That's oh, true. Man. Yeah. I am heartedly caring <laughs> <up> right now. <laughs> Thinking see, about that. See, no, I think... It makes me think of uh, his dark materials where we see uh, demons without their children and how they're lost and yeah. broken. And I just Ooh. picture the same thing being put on Syl. Oh. That's good. Uh, see, I Sorry love take the down. <laughs> I love characters suffering. Like in in my own writing and stuff, I'm like, oh man, characters suffering. This is my favorite. That's what I love about Rhythm of War. Like Kaladin, he is just punched down real hard. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I don't I. I'm just so used to a Brandon ending that's like, oh, maybe some bad stuff happened, but it's like, it's still hopeful. It's like, yeah, Navani may have uh, invented a weapon that can kill every spren ever, but you know, oh, it's still a, somehow a hopeful ending. And then it's like, oh, then Teravangian is Odium. It's like, oh, that's not good. That's really bad. But like, it, well, I mean, how does he, how is he going to do this? I don't know. Well, think of it from a storytelling perspective. Like, put yourself in Brandon's shoes. You have a reputation of being a great fantasy <laughs> author who's not as dark as his contemporaries. Imagine how well you could deliver a haymaker if you suddenly went dark, if you went Abercrombie, if you went Lawrence, and like all of a sudden your audience is just left broken and you're like, and come back for the next one. They have to, now, right? Like, they're like, okay, I gotta. I mean, speaking of Brandon doing dark things, the freaky spren corpses at the end of <laughs> rhythm of war like that was yeah. super disturbing i'm like i don't know where that's going that was in your head like why <laughs> that's what i'm saying the guy's got it in him he's yeah. willing to go there and he's talked about being a big fan of series that go that dark so i think Ooh. he's willing to do it and he's setting it up if you I, I'm talking to the experts here, but if you look back at this series with the mindset of, is he setting up something darker? I think you can find a lot of evidence to support it. I mean, there's, Definitely maybe that. there's literally a death rattle that says the darkness becomes a palace. Let it rule. Let it rule. It's like, yeah, that doesn't sound good. That really <laughs> does not. Uh, I can't interpret that positively. <laughs> the, the we're talking about. We're talking about the author who said who invented the Mistborn world, which is the bad guys won. We're sitting in this for decades. <laughs> and that could be Stormlight. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. I am I'm I I'm a big fan of like of of like I don't want to say uh, Grimdark, but like the darker stuff. I am definitely a fan, like I said, Berserk and Poppy War is is dark stuff. And I'm like, every branding Brandon doesn't ever normally go that dark, but if he did, I'd be like I'm down for that. I am down for that. It's it's just like <laughs> we, we we get the phase of Brandon where he wears black eyeshadow and his bangs are down and <laughs> yeah, it ha has like a choker on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that'd be good. That'd be solid. I it's just the thing with like Stormlight endings though is it's it's like about heroes doing heroic things. It's not like Joe Abercrombie or like there there are legitimate heroes and they're trying to do the right thing and. So I, I like like heroes dying because they died because of their ideals. Like that could be good. Uh, yeah. But it's just like, I don't know if he can do grim dark, but I, I mean, he could prove me wrong. <laughs> he could prove me wrong, but it, it might just I be mean, stormlight six or 10 endless bummer. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to get, okay. Oh, I'm saying we're going to go full grim dark. He's not going to have the grotesque murder scenes. You know, we're not going to get the details of the knife going in and out of Adolin's neck as he screams out in pain. <laughs> um, but I just think he's going to be willing to, so I feel like I'm ruining people's day. <laughs> 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 well, this 
Starcast, we're chatting I, with Daniel Green. Get starker than you expect. You know, no big deal. <laughs> um, but I just can see him delivering a darker timeline, a darker ending in that sense. You know, in, in the community sense, the Abed with the mustache kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. I'm really worried that uh, that Brandon's version of dark though is it's Moash with a Bridge Four universe, uniform dyed black, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Brandon, did you, Brandon? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you have to do that. <laughs> it's and now and now he's blind, so now he's like a demon hunter from World of Warcraft. Oh, he's, like, gonna, he's, gonna he's got, got blindfolds. It's just like oh, no, he's gonna put he's gonna put a cowl on, right? And it's gonna have like that is, and then that's that's he, where Moash is going. <laughs> he's got a sill, but it's red. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, easy. It's like my sharp blade's red. What's up? Uh, I get an evil. Sharp she blade. talks like a valley girl. She's mad. <laughs> <laughs> these, these are 10 out of 10 book six theories back half theories so moash is, like if, if calvin survives we need to have moash do exactly that it's like oh yeah your your blade glows blue well i have an evil void spread now and uh it it turns into a red blade what's up yeah there you go what if moash is responsible for the death of adolin and that's what sets up calvin showdown with him that's go. now there that's plausible that's really that's plausible that's that's theory right there. he he hates <laughs> light eyes theory. It, he hates light eyes so adolin's a great like ah you think the light eyes are good well this guy is actually a piece of garbage and now i'm gonna kill him that's um, really plausible actually yeah. you have to remember sanderson also wrote the ending of wheel of time where we have a showdown between a god and a man and we could have dalinar and teravangian doing that and a similar situation where teravangian is going look your son's dead in an attempt to break dalinar and then dalinar you know continues to push on i'm i'm sorry oh, i just have these no, ideas no, no, these are good. Get to get them these out. are good no 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 <laughs> yeah no oh, we gotta get you back on the show i just look at five, Ian, like, like i kick your puppy <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's it's good. It's all good. Uh, I want to I want to throw out there the the longest the longest writing project I've ever finished. It was twenty five thousand words, right? And it was an alternate ending to Oathbringer where (laughs) Dalinar falls to Odium and just everyone dies. I'm like, I know know where your head's at. Don't worry, I've been there. I'm like, I've written it. It was great. I had a lot of fun. (laughs) It was a lot. I believe the comments were that this is a real bummer. Uh... (laughs) Everyone hated me, and it was great. (laughs) Oh man. See, uh, something I do appreciate about him having gods as the villain. There's two approaches to kind of writing gods as villains or a part of your world. You can do the Erickson approach, which is you never get in their head because as a writer, how in the world could you do that? Or you write them as a more traditional Greek god who's very human, very flawed, they're jealous, they're angry, they're just super beings. And I think Sanderson is a very good example of how to do that. Odium is childish in some ways. I mean, he's <laughs> an egomaniac. He's he's on that level where it's like, oh, I would hate you if we were in high school together. Like that's You can think <laughs> that of Odium. You're like, I want to hit you really hard. Um, and I think, you know, he's proof that that way can be done to great effect because there's, there is, there are people who are like, no, you can never write a God to have like internal monologue and I, I, or dialogue. And I'm like, I disagree. You definitely can. You just have to go more of a ancient, uh, mythology route, you know, Thor jumping up on a table and cutting someone's head off because he's mad kind of route. Yeah, pr- presumably mm-hmm. like Teravangian has a chapter icon now. So, I mean, we're going to get more of him. <laughs> they wouldn't do a chapter icon if he wasn't going to come up later. Like he's. Mm-hmm. Oh, our heroes Unless are that's scary. a troll. I mean, <laughs> that's true. I wouldn't put it past them. <sighs> Book five you starts with Psych Teravangian died of a heart attack. Moving on. Cultivation <laughs> takes sodium. That's 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 the prologue. <laughs> or no, that can't be the prologue. There's too much stuff for the prologue to do uh, in book five. Because we're going to see Gavilar okay. book five. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to compliment Sanderson on something I don't see people mention enough. They yes. often talk about J.K. Rowling with this, and it makes me mad, because all she did was make up fake Latin. That's all she's done with her words. <laughs> Sanderson is an extraordinary word inventor. They sound right. They mm. sound fitting for the world. Mm. They convey a vibe that fits all the way back to his earliest works. He's been amazing at making words. And I appreciate that because I'm so tired of coming co- across like, this is the chubby and the chubby. And I'm like, stop. <laughs> like, I loved it. Speaking of that, like in Oathbringer, when Leshwi's talking with Moash, it's like, oh, yeah, you have a singer name. And I'm like, oh, 
he totally does have a singer name and I can see how it does and like how mm. the passions integrated and you just didn't know it the whole time. And like, mm. oh, Don Singers. Oh, right. They're the singers. Right. Yeah. I feel really stupid mm. now that that <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. That's a, that's a level where he's taking his word invention and weaving it into the story. And yeah. I'm like, brilliant. And his... people are like, J.K. Rowling did that. And I'm like, she'd get this freaking Latin. It's just Latin. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> or it's like, Certain cultures have like very distinctive names, like um, Axendweth, who shows up in uh, the the flashbacks in Rhythm of War. It's like that is such a terrorist name. It's like I saw that. I'm like, okay, this is a terrorist woman. She is a world hopper. I am freaking out right now. Yeah, I'm curious. Are there any other big Cosmere connections that Daniel may have not gotten that we need to blow his mind on? Speaking of accent, uh, I read a lot of comments for a lot of connections. The issue is I confuse Cosmere connections with King connections because, like, the King multiverse I have mapped out in my head. So I'm trying to have these two universes, and I'm like, Pennywise. No, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't go up there. Which, which unmade is Pennywise? Like, you know. Dalinar becomes Pennywise. Easy. Book five. Oh. Done. Shallan becomes Pennywise. If anyone has the potential <laughs> to be Pennywise, don't even, don't even swing. That's true. Um, That's true. Yeah. I think I've had most of them told to me pretty directly. They're definitely some of the smaller ones. Well, the thing is, I'm also convinced there's a thousand we haven't picked up because we just haven't been shown the yeah. connection yet. We have point A, not point B, or even C. Yeah. Um, so th there's going to be more. Uh, but I, what was your favorite big connection, though? What is your biggest, oh, crap, that's a, that's a Cosmere it's a Cosmere loop moment. Um, Thydekar. It's a Thydekar. 100% Thydekar being Kelsier. Like, there, Brandon That's even, Brandon That's even said in like 2015, before we knew Kelsier was still alive, I think, that mm -hmm. he was just like, so if Kelsier were to join a Rosharan secret society, which would he join? And Brandon said he would join the Ghostbloods and would probably uh, be in control of it in within a year. Like that, Brandon said that with a straight face. I was like, wow, that's good. Because Thydekar name dropped in the prologue of Way of Kings. And like, you have mm -hmm. Gavilar die. It's like, oh, Thydekar is too late. It's like, oh yeah, that's referring to Kelsier. Never would have figured that out in 2010. And then, uh, oh, Resteris. Oh, apparently another Herald. All right, cool. Uh, just name dropping all the things. <laughs> It's more complicated than this, but Kelsier is just too angry to die. And that's one of my that's favorite true. qualities of a person to have. Yeah, yeah. He punched he's God angry twice. to the point where he's been... Yeah, he's, in a, he's angry to a point where they've put him in another world so he can keep being mad. That's, that's Kelsier's arc as a character. That, that one really got me because uh, I didn't catch that because I was so, like, taken by race dying that I just like wasn't processing words anymore and then Hoyt had that conversation and then other people like think about Lord of Scars for a second Eric I'm like yeah okay yeah that's a wow that's that's a thing I was, I was reading that scene and I was messaging you guys and I was just like I was like oh Lord of Scars that's a that's a weird thing to call a shard and then you're like then think about it and I was like <gasps> <laughs> yeah it's like I, I also didn't twig on it immediately. It's like Lord of Scar. I'm like, okay, like yeah, there's like a cele um, celestial like constellation called, called the, the Scar. Scar. Yeah. Like it's like the swath of red stars in the the sky. I'm like, I'm like, oh, oh wait, oh, oh, that's not good. Well, one of our podcasters, she is so annoyed Kelsier didn't go into the beyond in Mistborn's secret history that she's just infuriated and she's just like, oh my god, frickin' Kelsier, again. Making a new <laughs> cult? What's new? Hey, she's not as mad as Kelsier is. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh, are there any other crazy uh, cosplayers? No, actually, yeah, go ahead. I would say my favorite is the just subtle things with wit. Everything yeah. with him that just is like a slight implication because it, it makes I mean, he's probably the most rereadable series character of the whole co Cosmere, in my opinion, because he's going to be the one you always come back to and go, what is he doing there? Because he's always doing something weird. He's the kid in class who just like has something going on. And so you're like, what are you doing here now? Why do you and have it's a jar like, of oh, sand? He's doing, yeah, it's like, why is there sand in your backpack? Why is there that there? And you have to like, so I, I was like. Why is there a knife that has this specific thing that's trying to like do a knife? That, does that communicate knife? Yeah, I don't sure. know. See, I got a pen. <laughs> See, I got this. Ah, get him. Yeah. Um, I don't have a pen. A I'm a glass. teacher. I'm um, a teacher. I got many writing utensils. I'm ready to go. 
Um, so for me, it, it's because he's the one who makes me think the most. Uh, he's the one who I'm always staring at going, I know you're implying 500 things right now. And we're not going to even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's like his, um, the, the, the girl who looked up story and it's like he told it and then we're sitting there and we're like, four, four years later, we're like, cool, there's like five allegories that this could be. And we're like, what are you saying here? I think we did a whole podcast on that. I think we did like 90 <laughs> minutes on that story. It's just yeah. like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> I just have a, a, like a, I don't know. I think the Cosmere is going to, because it's this like living, growing thing in its own. Uh, I think we're going to see this thing go through a darker phase and that's going to mm. probably be book five, onward for five years and then it'll come into this star trek s thing because that's what you gotta remember even the star trek universe went through the warring times where things were okay. dark to get to where it got to to continue that comparison even though they're not paralleling stories right yeah, um, so I, don't know. I just uh, i just i like that idea <laughs> yeah oh man but it's it's gonna be longer than five years because it's still gonna take three years to write a stormlight book so oh yeah so, that's right so we'll 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 be all old people uh back back in <laughs> uh, uh 30 years from now and it's like oh yeah mm. hey that, that stormlight 10 it's pretty crazy and then was like oh we we still don't have miss born era 4 oh <laughs> sad i don't know if this is a question that's ever been asked in the podcast so if it is just edit this out that's fine let's say a jordan scenario happens unfortunately and we need to find a replacement to continue and finish the Cosmere and sift through his million notes. Is there an author that jumps out to you as this guy could continue the Cosmere? Definitely me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, um, hmm. I, I know when Brandon has been asked, he's sometimes thrown out Brian McClellan, hmm? who was his student. And like, I, I do think he would do a good job of it. I know yeah. Brandon's trying to get his art director Isaac. Like Isaac's gonna write some uh, Cosmere, and so maybe that mm -hmm. long term mm -hmm. could be a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And makes sense because he's internal to Dragon Steel, so it's like, yeah, I know all this stuff. Uh, so that mm -hmm. would probably be good. But I don't know if he's written like big epic fantasy. But oh, mm -hmm. that's a depressing thought to think about, though. Let's. I mean, <laughs> hey, it's an interesting discussion, though. Mm -hmm. I I don't think I I know enough authors like fantasy authors. Unfortunately, I'm like oh my yeah fair yeah. Um, Daniel was the real void bringer all along. He just <laughs> he takes he brings the void. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I'd be Debbie Doubter Daniel today, but I'm happy to do no, it. No, no, no. This uh, is great. I didn't say it had to be. <laughs> oh. I didn't say it had to be an alive author, so I'm just going to say Jordan and move on. Bam. Um, I'm, I've got one. I've got a favorite author in in sci-fi, um, and he's a, he does he does a lot of the Warhammer books. Ooh. So he's already used to writing uh, extended universes, and he also does great stuff with like gods and religion. And is, is uh, Aaron Dembski Bowden is one of my favorite sci-fi authors. He does great. He writes the best Warhammer books. If you read Warhammer book, it used to be Dan Abnett was top. <laughs> now it's Aaron Dembski Bowden. I totally that don't guy. know who any of those people are. I know people, Warhammer's people who know they are. Yeah. It's a good thing. <laughs> I Really good actually going sci-fi. I think the combo yeah. of uh, the authors that come together to make the Expanse authors could do a great job because they've done a phenomenal yes. job building that universe. And they have, a, they have a, a way of writing, I think, wouldn't be too jarring uh, flipping over to Sanderson. Mm. Uh, did they used to be students of his? I, they had him no. as a cover. And One of they them... The oh. assistant to George Martin. There you go. Yes, oh. that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking George R. Martin. But yeah, you do need to kind of have like a sci-fi author if it's like the last Mistborn stuff. But yeah, at least I would I'll also oh. throw mm -hmm. Robert Jackson Bennett into the mix. Um, he wrote the Divine Cities trilogy and also Foundry Side, which is a also a like very like sciencey approach to magic, like magic magical programming almost i need to read more non it's interesting books. how many authors come to mind that you, there are great authors but they just wouldn't fit yeah like they just yeah. Couldn't yeah do it mm -hmm. like I, I, I was thinking like feist he, he couldn't write a sanderson book and kay jimson could not write a sanderson book she writes That's true an extraordinary material they're but very like, different it would be such like mm -hmm. yeah i couldn't picture her trying to take dalinar anywhere it's, <laughs> yeah 
it's not gonna it's not gonna fit <laughs> i gotta read broken earth uh my fiance read them and it's just like oh yeah, yeah. you should read them. i've read the first and book then jim butcher would do an entirely game. wrong direction yeah, yeah. oh, oh I'm, god uh, I'm, jim, I'm doing tim butcher would not do good <laughs> i'm slowly going through codex Lara, and well <laughs> codex Lara is good i'm like yeah this, this is not cosmere level this is <laughs> Yeah. Jim's just having fun, though. Uh, I was just thinking of how many. <laughs> I was about to say Jim just has too much fun. He's not focused enough. Uh, it took him fourteen Dresden books to get to the point where he's finally having a big <laughs> thing that's like a, an apocalyptic event. <laughs> oh man, I'm I'm really excited for later Dresden books, though. Not not to get totally off task, but it's like I want that apocalyptic trilogy. That is going to be awesome, and I'm not going to remember half the characters because I'm like, yeah, you're yeah, you're that person hmm, yes i totally remember from book eight like I, I don't know i found with butcher if i keep all the factions straight I'm yeah fine. as long yeah. as you remember this person with them you're good you just gotta remember okay they're they're in that camp you're a black you're court you're right. bad okay i don't need to remember details he usually does uh like catch up people pretty well you know, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's that horrible person from mm-hmm. that one time. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> screw that person. Because he has black court vampires, I, I, I picture them as very distinct. Like white court, that's borderline Twilight vampires, right? They're feeding yeah, up yeah, emotion. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah, yeah. sexy. Blah. Yeah. Red court, much more like Blade. They're these intense fighters <laughs> that are kind of animalistic in that sense. Mm-hmm. And then Black Court, I always just picture Nosferatu, even though Me that's too. not right at all. Like, it's just where my brain went mm-hmm. and I can't take it away. But because I think of Nosferatu and I'm a millennial, I think of the SpongeBob episode with Nosferatu. And then every single time a Black Court vampire is mentioned, I run through that entire sequence. In my head. <laughs> Excellent. That's just a fun fact. <laughs> just think of the hash singing slasher for five minutes. Yeah. What other non Adolin rhythm of war things do you want to talk about, Daniel? I, I imagine you had thoughts, but I know you've also read a bunch of books since. So. That's the problem with reading. Uh, it's all right. Um, I definitely still have a lot of things. Uh, so for me, I, I specifically the structure of Shalon's story bothered me a bit. Her development of a personality that turned out not to be what we thought it was would have benefited greatly, in my opinion, if it had been a hanging mystery for the whole book. But it was very much so in one part established, uh, walked through and resolved. And I was like, that just felt way too fast. I needed that to be, you know, hundreds of pages, not I think it was maybe 50. I, I don't know the you know, exact number off the top of my head. That one bugged the crap out of me. She was like the B plot of the B plot. Like it was. Yeah. yeah. It, it very much so felt like Brandon went, oh, I need something for her to do. OK, she's going to do this. Um, and that, that just that, that rubbed me the wrong way, especially because I do enjoy her character. So I'm always looking for her to do some crazy stuff. And she did a lot of crazy stuff here. It just wasn't the crazy stuff I was looking for her to do uh, for that section of the book. It felt like it was just like, pause. There's a thing happening. And yeah. OK, undo. Done. Like, I don't know. It kind of it kind of bugged me, especially because there are directions you could take that specific idea with her and do really interesting things with it. But now we can't pull that out of the bag again because it's been pulled out of the bag. Like if, you, if we did a similar thing, it would just feel like uh, we're walking down a path we did. And even if you went in a different direction, it's just, it feels uh, not mysterious. Hmm. I, was already, I was already, at the very beginning of the book, I was worried about how retreading Oathbringer ground already because when uh, the balance between Shalon Vale and Radiant started to fall out of whack, I was like, isn't this just Oathbringer again? I'm like... But oh, it did obviously end up going in a different direction. But yeah, I could see it happening again. Well, it, it, it's funny for me, like Shalon is a character I always am compelled by in the pages. She's not my favorite, but she's always someone who is being handled in a way where I'm curious. And so I guess I was just extra disappointed because I was like, I'm always, oh, there's going to be something new developing here. And instead it was kind of just a little loop for her to have this thing pop up that turned out to be essentially herself. And I was like, eh, all right, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm, I didn't get any satisfaction from that little thing. Interesting. It felt such like wheel spinning. And I, just, I, can't, I, hate, I can't stand that. Because if you can, as an author, I'm so tired of uh, authors who take up gargantuan page counts that don't earn it. And Sanderson's usually not guilty of that. He's yeah. usually like earning the thickums boys that he puts out. Uh, but that one just felt like absolutely 100% could just scoop it right out and we would not have lost a thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
it, it is funny reading the comments. It's like Rhythm of War could have been 300 pages. I'm like, I don't know about that. No. Uh, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Uh, well, like, I, I thought the flashbacks were like, like they were fine, but they weren't incredible, right? Mm. And there was a little mm. bit too much Calden fighty fighty for me, you know? Like, Calden did a lot of magical fighting, and I could have gone for a little bit less of that. That would have been fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also just had some problems, as you said, I, I agree, Kaladin's, I loved his mental health representation, because someone, as someone who suffers from stuff he suffers from, perfect, and I have family members with PTSD, so I've seen moments like that, and it was so real, it was so on the point, or so on the, on the money, on the ball. What? Words are hard. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, I on the money ball plane. Uh, we're, we're trying to be authors. We, we talk good and use word things. Mm-hmm. What? I'm, I have a background in communications. I have no excuse. Uh, I'm a math major, so it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, but there was just a couple moments with him where it was a little like, okay, the horns are rising and then he crashed. And I like that because I felt that where you're like, I'm going to get over it. And nope. Um, so all, all of that worked. Mm-hmm. It, there was just some moments and some presentation things. And I think specifically the dynamic with his family bugged me, but I think it's bugged me because it, it struck a nerve where I've had to struggle, like communicating, like, this is what this feels like. So deal with, like, you can't just tell me to move, stop. No, it's not a good thing. And so it kind of like, worked in a way where it made me not enjoy reading it because i was like i feel like i need to call and yell at my dad <laughs> <laughs> i mean a lot of people were like oh my god liren <sighs> uh, i, I yeah, loved it made me because... very angry <laughs> <laughs> but which you know i will praise the book for that if you get an emotional response from me that's a positive unless the emotional response is like i want to tear my eyes out for reading this because it is so horrible like ready player um, two you know which there's only <laughs> <laughs> i watched that uh, review that I, was you a good one. Re- <laughs> i held back in that ready player two <laughs> is you- the most blatant cash grab i have ever seen <laughs> i'm not even not exaggerating in the lead up to this eric was like oh you should you should watch his ready player two uh, review because you can tell he's having to hold back that's true. <laughs> I, I just liked how you were like, look, I'm not trying to be like sensationalist for no reason, but like, man, I could tell you just hated that book. It was great. It was it was yeah. just great when people are trying to be objective and like, I'm so upset about this. <laughs> well, I I went far too far with my fifth sorcerer's review, or I, I got personal. I literally said, like, this author hates women because he didn't get laid. Like, that's just like what oh, it felt yeah, like to I me. That, and I hate yeah. this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and I, I was like, I can't go that because that was personal. It was too, even though I 100% stand by that accusation. <laughs> and it, all it is is an accusation. I, I can't say that in a review. So I was more restrained with Ready Player Two. But I, I, I am upset. I spent my time reading it because it had no artistic merit and was just something that was put out to get fans to recognize a franchise and spend money. Uh, and I think that's the most like hollow thing a creative can do. So- Someone mm. pasted like three paragraphs from Ready Player Two, and just the pop culture references were so insufferable that it had like nothing to do with anything. I was just like, "This is awful!" <laughs> like I wouldn't let writing group get away with crap like that. Like it's it's just insane, right? <laughs> yeah, it's to me. So he he got criticized a lot for Ready Player One for how like appealing to suburban white dudes it was, which you know you can criticize him for that or you can be okay with it. I'm not. You know, I'm that, so it doesn't bother me as much as I'm sure it does other people. Sure. But he clearly in this book was like, I'm going to address these criticisms. So we're going to stop the action and talk about how Tolkien didn't put enough people of color in Lord of the Rings and criticize him for that and stop everything to do that for a while. Tolkien was racist, guys. And I'm sitting here like, dude, (laughs) this is not how you do this at all. That is. (laughs) If you want to weave a message in, you weave it. (laughs) You don't you don't hammer it like a nail. No, it's just a hemorrhagic change. spike in the book. It's just like, hey, what's up? I'm woke. Oh my god. But narratively, it felt like the equivalent of like in the '80s, like PSAs, where they're like, drugs are bad. Like it, it felt like that, and I was like, yeah. dude. And then a bunch of people sent me his weird speech he gave, where he read a poem about pornography, and I was like, I'm I've, done I've with them. This. I'm, no, I've, I've heard of I'm this. Out, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, then I was like, I'm, I'm out. Uh, I don't know where Ready Player One came from because I maintain that's a fun, charming book. It's not deep. It's just cool. It's got a lot of things that are going for it, and I enjoyed it. But Ready Player Two just completely fell apart for me. Oh, my 
God. Mm. I almost want to read it for the train wreck, but reading a book is much more than just like watching a bad movie. Because like a bad movie, it's just like two hours, right? Like, yeah, it could yeah, be like funny to like piece apart how terrible a movie is. But like a book, you just got to like read it. It's like a bad video game, you know, like you don't want to finish a terrible yeah. video game, right? I will say Fifth Sorceress is a good enough train wreck to get you all the way through because there's <laughs> so many creative decisions. There are so many decisions where you're like, there's like steel men. You like they're making like incredible. I don't know if it's steel. They're making like advanced pieces of like metallurgy and stuff. And your protagonist invents throwing a knife. <laughs> he invents it. I'm remembering I'm your review here now. I'm like, no one needed a knife before in this world. No one's no, no one one's gone this pointy right there. It's like I need this knife over there, and I and I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he plays fetch with a horse as well. Which, by is the way, how he invents, can't play fetch. Is with that a how horse. he invents the knife throwing? No, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a good book. But That's for the I, sequel, uh, Ben. Come I, on, it, <laughs> for the sixth yeah, sorcerer. I, I called a friend of mine who works the horses during that review to be like, "Can you play fetch with a horse?" And she thought I was trying to be positive for a book. I didn't. I wasn't aware of this, so she was like. Yeah, like, and kind of tried to justify it after I released the video and she watched, she's like, dude, you should have told me it's a bad book. I would have told you, no, you have to specifically train a horse for years to do anything like that. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, oh you, my it, God. And just having a book where there is violent sexual assault and stuff like this, and it's not treated as like a serious subject matter. And then oh, also no. having like gnomes play a huge role. It's like, I... <laughs> Why? <laughs> Those are some oh. creative choices. Oh. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's 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 it's. Do you ever get the feeling like because you know you're you're writing and stuff, uh, and I've been trying to write for a long time. But like when you read a bad book, you feel a lot better about your writing, you know, and your creative choices. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. It's like wow, that book was terrible. <laughs> I could do better than that. <laughs> And the biggest ego boost is writing a bad book from a good author, which sounds horrible, but it lets you know that everyone has a turd, so you can have a turd. That, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it opens... I mean, I hope people have turds at least regularly, but, but as a book, yeah. Like, that's a, it's part of my love of Stephen King, because you'll pick up a King book and you're like, that was a mistake to write. But then you're like, that means I can do it. Cool. Because um, I mean, King's one of so the greatest many. American authors of all time, in my opinion. Yeah, um, and he doesn't remember writing some of them for various reasons. So I believe like, it. Yeah, let's. Yeah. yeah, so it's like I I'm okay trying my. If I hadn't read uh, the Longest Walk, which I think is a bad Stephen King book, I wouldn't probably be writing my novella right now because it gave me such an ego boost to be like, if King can write that, I can write something better than that. Cool. Some of Brandon's um, unpublished works are like that too, which you can get. Uh, like his White Sand prose. I like. I know some people think it's better than Elantris. I did not like that book, and I was like, wow, this is not very good. Uh, and, it, and it's a bonus. It's just like, oh, you just got to write a lot, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. You're you're very bold for, like, I don't know if I could, like, actually release my stuff, because I think I would need, like, a decade to actually be good yeah. enough to actually want people to actually see it, you know? So that yeah. that is ballsy, man. <laughs> I'm preparing to release something bad. That's my approach. Um, mm -hmm. I am genuinely telling my audience my pros are weak. It's I'm not a I have no background and I'm not even an English major. I have no like background in that whatsoever. Prepare for amateur. Um, but it's mainly just a I want to do this before I die. And yeah. if, hey, I find a hundred people who dig it and they want me to go further, I'll write for them. Um, that's the entire mindset going into it. Because it's you know, writing it's oddly competitive, but if you kind of do away with that, it becomes extraordinarily enjoyable. There's a phrase that um, I always think about whenever I'm releasing something, which is, um, our art is never completed, it's just abandoned. Mm -hmm. and it's like, <laughs> Brandon could have made Rhythm of War even better, I'm sure, with another year, but he's just like, that's good enough, you know? Yeah. yeah when you release something, it's kind of like, you kind of, you, immediately after releasing something, you want to be like, no, I want to take that back, and I want to change some stuff, I want to fix things, but you can't, it's, got, it's out there now. I mean, he did do that with Birds of Radiance. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sure. that one was <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> still very weird that he did that, but yeah. But hey, it's yes. I, 
I believe an author does own their work in some senses, though I am more leaning towards that you don't own it entirely, Camp. Uh, but if, if an author wants to put out a new, I recently have my mind kind of changed on this. If an author wants to put out a new edition and they say, go with this for the rest of my work, they have the right to do that. You as the fan, though, can go, no, I like this. I'm sticking True. with that. And no one can fault you. Uh, but I, I think he has every right to do that. If he wants to, if he wants to come back and say, hey, Kaladin's name's actually Kaladin. All right. <laughs> I'm I not going to say Kaladin. you're wrong. It's, it's Kaladin, actually, uh, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm never going to say that, but you no, can no. say that as the author. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. kind of relationship. But I mean, you don't need to worry about you not having an English major. Like, there's so many authors who's just like, yeah, I was a physicist and I wrote stuff. And it's like, yeah, my prose isn't great. That's not why you're reading my stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my, my, my favorite author, Robert Jordan, he was a he was a nuclear engineer, nuclear physicist, something along those lines. And he went, eh, I want to write. Was? And then just really. Yeah, he was oh. not. Yeah, he was, uh, I think. After Vietnam, yeah, he went and he was working as a scientist. And then he was like, Meh, wheel of time, <laughs> which, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, well, he, he started with Conan and some historical fan. Right. You know, but yeah, he yeah. you just got to write enough that. And my issue is struggling with depression and time, you know, like that. Yeah, it's rough to have time to write. Hmm. I anger, right? I get mad at myself and I'm like, time to put more out. So it's just, just like, OK, you can't not. So I just mm. angrily write what I wanted to write. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Wow, we've been blabbing a lot. Yeah, this has been are. really oh. fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like how Ben's yeah. like, oh, oh, yeah. We, <laughs> no, we're, 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 we got been like an hour. <laughs> yeah, I like actually. The topics have we actually gotten through? Oh, uh, I mean, Two. we, we, no, 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 no. We, we've gotten through more than that. But I don't know. I, I, I imagine we should probably start. I don't think anyone wants to listen to two and a half hour. Like, no offense, <laughs> but not many people like giant podcasts. And I'm frankly astonished that people listen to our two hours, 45 minutes Rhythm of War reactions. And then we put out a two hours, 50 minutes, part two of that. And 12,000 views on one and 8,000 on the other. I'm like, damn, I... one of the top YouTube search things is Rhythm of War spoilers. So it's like, okay, I mean, we're the channel that's we're doing that. Like, <laughs> we're, we're doing that. Uh, but I feel like people like shorter YouTube videos. It's like 15 yes. minute videos. Uh, so peek behind the curtain. Uh, YouTube promotes you more if you're longer, but your engagement is worse unless you're really good. So if you're going to have a 20 minute video, you better be ready to put in five times the effort of an eight minute video because you got to maintain that attention. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, especially with visuals and all this kind of stuff you're working with, you need to. That's why you know buying into epidemic sound for sound effects, buying into stock footage, things like that is a must if you're going for those lengths. This face is not that engaging. <laughs> mm. I, don't, I don't know daniel i think you got a pretty engaging face you know <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe uh, i'm biased because i'm a teacher it's like students pay to see my face good sir <laughs> 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 uh, but then i get the comments that my uh, voice is annoying so it's like oh okay great cool uh, uh but youtube recently lowered the um ad roll length to eight minutes which made a lot of creators suddenly stop stretching out their videos and so mm -hmm. now you're actually seeing more people get used to finishing a youtube video because it's like oh this didn't need to be pushed out two additional minutes granted people are still trying to push two minutes of content to eight now but it's it's a lot better than two minutes of end minute content to ten um so there's there's that was actually a smart move in my opinion granted there are some people who make an eight minute video and they put four ad breaks i think that's absolutely crazy but, uh, we yeah, don't even yeah. put an ad break Target on our shows. We don't yeah. do mid rolls <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, we're You're just going the, the the bold red letter media route. Have an hour and a half of content with like one ad. Yeah, if, <laughs> if ad we go ad? over yeah, three hours, I think we can do a mid roll. I think I think people will buy it at that stage. But like <laughs> one. But how do you do videos that are like shorter than fifteen minutes? Like I did a YouTube video. <laughs> I thought problem. I I thought I was so snappy. Uh, and it was like a numbered list. So YouTube loves numbered lists. It's like great, but like, I don't know. I think I did like 30 minutes of recording and I cut a th like half of it, uh, editing. You're probably better at talking because you're used to actually recording YouTube videos and not stumbling over your words constantly, where as short scripted content is not a thing that I know how to do. It's hard. I, uh, I have a tremendous background in public speaking. Uh, my dad, since essentially I could talk, was putting me in front of people and saying, speak. Uh, and so it, that was a, a really 
big boon to my ability to make YouTube videos. Granted, I've improved a lot. If you watch my older content, it's not great. Uh, but you know, I, I've been reading stuff from Aristotle and Plato about rhetorics before I could, you know, read the wheel of time. Cause that's what my dad was like, you need to learn this because it's a very true thing. If you want to make society a better place, teach people rhetoric, teach people how to debate and find the truth and use logic. That's how you uh, can basically solve, in my opinion, like half the problems the world faces. And not like then horrendous people... log logical fallacies all the time. Exactly. Well, <laughs> there's also the logical fallacy fallacy. Just because something is a logical fallacy does not make it wrong. Uh, That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, but just teaching people how to concisely and coherently uh, speak their mind and get to the point is a very valuable thing. And it's something I encourage so, so, so many people to, to, to train themselves at, because it's something you need to genuinely train yourself to do. Um, so that's, that's, that's the key. That's the secret ingredient to uh, making, making good videos. <laughs> come, come, come listen to our two hour podcast where uh, we used to have a cast member who like, was like, no, you can't do over 90 minutes. And I think our first podcast in Oathbringer, 44 minutes. And I was on epigraphs <laughs> and for rhythm of war, uh, I, I left it in the episode that's over two hours so it's like we've really honed our craft <laughs> really well <laughs> it makes no that's fun. for podcasts i feel like it's it's better to do that because podcast is more like a hangout experience people want to feel like they're chilling they're, they're getting in the deep for me it's a quick review do i want to buy it do i want to not that's yeah. true or it's a skit yeah. where i'm shooting myself in the face mm. like i put out today <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like um when we were as i said i've been doing this series with my wife uh, where she's reading through the cosmere and the first episode we did was miss the whole mistborn era one trilogy <laughs> we did in we did it in 40 minutes um now we do two hours per part of a stole my book <laughs> <laughs> people so, are still uh, upset yeah. that's like you only did 40 minutes for Mistborn yeah, and, they, yeah, and then they still get mad when we miss stuff He's like you didn't talk about so and so and I'm like <laughs> we're already they're 50, minute, they're 50 hour work. audiobook guys <laughs> like yeah we're yeah. gonna miss things uh, yeah it, well, I mean, you guys at least have the credibility of like, you know, the Cosmere, right? I'm That's sitting true. in the camp of like, I, 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 I think I remember the key parts of Rhythm of War enough to do a review and then I'm going to move on. And yeah. so it's like every time I get asked a question, it's like, how do you feel about the way Teravangian delivered this line to Dallin? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, he said it. <laughs> We're, um... In the new year, one of the videos we want to do is uh, there's the Call to Adventure Stormlight game. Um, I want to do a video where we mm. like explain how to play it and then like play a game of it. And I'm so worried that I'm going to miss a rule or like misunderstand something because like we've never done that, but kind of context here before. I kind of like, forgot we were I'm planning like, to do that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm going to need to read that <laughs> instruction book. Oh, yeah. Because YouTube comments will notice. YouTube comments will always yeah. notice. Uh, mm -hmm. YouTube yeah. comments mostly just complain about our pronunciation, though, honestly. It's like, that's not how that's pronounced at all. And it's like, well, the audiobook actually changes sometimes. So I I used to always say I'd go with Michael Kramer and Kate Redding, and then people showed me them pronouncing things differently, and I went, mother. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, no. it was it was always a pet peeve of mine that they pronounce Sadius two different ways. They pronounce like Sadius and Sadius, and I was like, I think it was Kate was one and Michael was the other, and I'm like, I'm like, you guys are married, like discuss this. And then me and Lucy, I just then me and Lucy do it the exact same thing. So I'm like, yeah, I can't make a complaint anymore. It, <laughs> they're in the same house recording. It's not even just that they're married; it's in their home. They're yeah. next to each other. It, literally, th this girl right here, sh she and I, we cannot agree on Adeline's pronunciation. I say Adeline, she says Adeline. And Does she? Yes. Didn't know that. Yeah, no, no, no. She feels very strongly about it. Like, we're going to get two kittens. We was like, Maya, great name for a cat. But, like, we would want the other one to be Adolin, but we can't agree on the pronunciation, so we can't do it. any of that for, for two kittens. It's just, we can't agree on both pronunciations, so it's just out. We're going to go to our grave about this. That That's it's for sure. You, Maya, Maya and Vin. That would be a good combo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vin is a good cat name. Finn's a good cat name. Oh, I like one syllable cat names because you can just get the pips. Like you just get it real quick and fast. And... <laughs> oh, man. Uh, oh, he just left. I'm sorry, <laughs> buddy. No, not We're leaving it in. We're leaving it in. It's already long enough. Whatever. It's fine. So how about we talk about what are you reading now, Daniel? What are you reading right now? 
I'm taking the rare opportunity to reread stuff I enjoy for the end of the year, just to make sure some <laughs> of my favorites are as good as I remember. Uh, so I am rereading the Greenbone Saga, which is probably the best new series I've picked up this year. It's an absolute masterpiece. Uh, Fonda Lee is probably in the top four fantasy authors working, in my opinion, just based off these two books. Um, and it's it's a great one-two punch of the first book I thought was really great. And then the second book I thought was pretty much perfect. Uh, I can't change a line of that one. Her prose aren't super strong, but in terms of storytelling and character, wow. Hey, we read so Brandon books. That. We don't need and perfect then, prose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> reread Miss Marnero um, 1, the prose is also rereading. <laughs> I'm also rereading Murderbot because I'm going to do a series review for it. And mm. Murderbot is so much fun. Absolutely. The idea of a socially awkward, depressed robot who can rip your head off is so cool. <laughs> uh, so I'm really, I actually bought every single one of the novellas uh, right there. And then I'm moving on to the next Expanse book and then the Chronicles of Amber. I forget cool. the name of the series. I just I, got the first book and I'll be reading it soon. I forget the name of it. So. I know that is the Ooh. name of a series. So. <laughs> it's, I, that it's that one. <laughs> oh, I, is it said like that? Is it said Chronicles of Am? <laughs> yeah, that, that's how the audiobook actually pronounces it. I don't know if you knew. <laughs> I actually think it's uh, tr- Welcome. I think it's Tronicles. <laughs> get out. Oh, okay. Get out. Get out. I'm removing <laughs> you from the call. I just uh, love the idea of like Gamer, uh, starting an audiobook and then going, Welcome to the Chronicles of Amber. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, my problem is I need to read more. Like, I just got to read more. So, Greenbone Saga, all right, I'm putting it on the list. It's in our doc now. I will hope to remember. Everyone that. I've given it to has said it's it's brilliant. Uh, I just got Murph to read it. She thought the Ooh. first one was really really solid. Um, my uh, girlfriend is the one who convinced me to give it a go, and it's it's. I, I mean, this is my problem, right? I read so much books just wash away. Like I right. just I can't remember. I remember like Witcher. The characters stand out really really. I remember the characters, but I don't remember the story hardly at all. Greenbone Saga, everything. I I could tell you scenes. Like it's Ooh. just so solidified in my brain. And it's for those of you for, to actually pitch the. Comic, Concept. It's essentially uh, Yakuza Godfather type fantasy setting, and it's not end of world stakes. It's not big bad Dark Lord. It's a crime syndicate family trying to recover as the next generation takes power. And ooh, is it good? Sometimes that good. I've never, never heard of it. Yeah, it's corruption arcs across the board, and oh, I love me some corruption arcs. <laughs> oh yes, okay, yeah, that that sold, that sold me. <laughs> All right, awesome. Sorry. Trying to think of what I've I'm currently reading and what I've recently read because Ben and I and another cast member Shannon have over the last month or so formed a little book club where we're recommending nice. books to each other. So it's like I just recently finished listening to Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth, which were both fantastic. So good. Um, I gotta I gotta ask you. Harrow the Ninth, everyone I've talked to has agreed. The first two thirds is a whole lot of, it's cool, but I don't know what's happening. And then all of a sudden it makes sense. <laughs> She's like, I have no idea what is going on, and it's awesome. It's so hard to like sell to people because it's like, <laughs> okay, so you're going to go into this book, you're not going to know what's happening for like 90%, but it's in a good way. Like, it's mm. good. <laughs> Yeah. Is this where I say not you're like in a Steven you wake Erickson up from a way? Nap and you're like, what continent am I on? It's that for a book. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry, then I'm finishing up a reread of Three Parts Dead, which is the first book in the craft sequence. I gotta finish is, that. Nice. Yes, you do. I read the first three. Um, They're good. They're yeah, fun. Because it's Ben and Shannon are now both working on Two, two Serpents Rise. Oh, I like that one. That one. That so one. it's like, because like I've read all of them, they're just working on it through the first time now. So, but like they were talking about it, and like, oh, craft sequence is good. I'm going to reread it. <laughs> um, then yesterday I started a Rage of Dragons, which I yes. know you've read. Um, <laughs> and I, I I did pick it up because you did the review and you've been talking about, talking it up. And then the last That's thing it. is. I've been welcome to the angriest book you're ever gonna read. That's what I, I heard gonna, when, when you were saying earlier about people characters too angry to die. I just thought, mm-hmm. yeah, that's. I was like, Rage of Dragons, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, it has rage in the title. It's it, rage it, in the title, it, yeah. It says what it's gonna do. Yeah. And then over the summer, I started a reread of my favorite manga series, uh, Subasa Reservoir Chronicle, 
by clamp which like i got like halfway through and then like i had to stop and like okay like i really need to get back into it because i i stopped it like right before like everything changes and i'm like i, I want to get to that point and then finish it and i'm like Ugh. it's good sounds good i need to pick yeah, up more so- manga i just haven't had the <laughs> <laughs> yeah super, yeah uh, like Tsubasa, um so like clamp is like a very like they've written a lot of manga and this was the series where they started playing with the multiverse Oh no! And so, like, you go to like all of these different worlds. Like, there, there's a standard like quest that the characters are going on, but like the vast majority of like characters that are being encountered are char- alternate reality versions of like characters from all of their other works. And so, and so, it's oftentimes like three worlds down the line is like okay, like, this is someone we met back in the first world, and it's like, you see, it, it's very well done. It's a cork board story where you're going to yes. you're gonna have to take notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope there's a good wiki. Um, yeah, so, like, a, like Ian said, I'm currently reading Two Serpents Rise, which is really good. I really um, like that one. For, yeah, uh, I'm like 85% of the way through. I, should, I could finish it in a night, I just need to find the time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just finished listening to the third Codex Alera book, um which is which is it's a cool series it's it's got like roman legions with magic people in it and i'm like cool i read it for that stuff uh there's other stuff in it which isn't as good but i'm like he writes good (laughs) roman legions with magic people in it um then and then i've just started burning god um which is the third book in the popular series um, so I'm going to be so really excited. curious to see what you you got to message me what you think about that at the end because I loved it Absolutely. although the last scene I was like I wish it had been a little different I would have changed one thing Ooh. so I, I'm curious okay. how you feel about the ending Oh man, I'll let you know yeah I remember the uh, end of Dragon Republic had me in tears uh, it, was, it was devastating so I'm fully expecting this to go the same kind of way <laughs> Rebecca Kwong as an author is willing to kick her, her character down, continue to kick them while they down, and then ask other people to come in the room and kick her character while it's down. It's just this continual beating of Rin where you're just like, stop, God! That sounds great. I, sh- I think I, I need just- to read these. I think that... Oh, that I was about to great. say a spoiler, but in that case I won't. <laughs> yeah, we probably shouldn't do like non- uh, Brandon spoilers. Stuff. Yeah, that, that'd probably be good. Uh, I'm not reading anything right now, and that's very embarrassing. But uh, I, it, <laughs> not embarrassing at all. Life, life is uh, work, uh, video editing, and uh, talking with my fiance when I have time. Uh, so it's like that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, I uh, fully endorse taking time to work on what you care about and not reading constantly. I am the most burnt out <laughs> reading person on the planet, mm. so I understand <laughs> the not just not right now feeling. Oh man, that. That would be really bad for you to burn out. So that, man. That's actually why I'm just rereading stuff I like right now. I'm justifying it by saying, like, I need to make sure. But in reality, it's like, I just want to read these amazing things. I just want to read fun things <laughs> and not like food, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'll say as well, on a, on a slightly different note, I'm also playing The Witcher 3 as well at the moment. Mm. Uh, because I never played The Witcher 3. And I have, like, a friend. Like, my be- one of my best friends has, like, 200 hours in it. And so I'm determined to beat him, and I'm at 130 hours, and I'm like, I'm gonna beat you. And this is literally all I've played this year. It's the only game I've played this year, <laughs> Witcher Three. And I'm like, I'm like, I am determined to beat his, his at his hour count. You're still at the first mission. You're just walking around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna beat you. <laughs> Oh. Just a horse doing a left turn <laughs> for 200 hours. But can you play fetch with that horse? That's the question. That's the question. Uh, <laughs> the most inci- excited, like, I should be saying the most excited release for me as a book for like my branding, but that's a lie. My most excited release is Cyberpunk 2077. I'm like nice. sitting here just like, if you it's delay this hyped. again, I'll fly to Poland. I will go there. <laughs> I'll just stand saying, outside your office angry. I didn't I didn't get it at all because like I've never I've only read the first Witcher book and then I tried to play Witcher One and the swamp section killed me and so I stopped playing it. Um, <laughs> right and, in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like chapter two or five, but it's like so long and there's so much swamp. Um 
And then, so like, when people started getting, I, I didn't play Witcher 3 for like five years after it came out. It was only this year I started playing it. And then, so I didn't get the hype for Cyberpunk 2077 until I've now put 130 hours in Witcher 3. And I'm like, no, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm looking forward to see what they do next. I'm looking forward to Cyberpunk now. Nice. They uh, need to do a Brandon game. Someday, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, someday. I, I remember the Miss Smart video game. I want a Total War style Brandon game. I'm actually Ooh. not like a Skyrim one. That'd be cool, but for me, I want to see like legions clashing. I want to like bring an army of specialist units that are uh, that are like you know, Mistborn in to like take out like from behind. Like I want something that kind of just, Sanderson scale. A Stormlight game on that level. Oh my god! True Desolation <laughs> Total War game where you you're fighting the Radiance versus uh, the Fused and stuff. Total War style game. And it's map of Roshar and stuff. That sounds awesome. That sounds and you don't have to care about the story, so bring it all in. Do Avengers stuff. I'll have Vin versus Kaladin in this. Who cares? It's yeah, not yeah, fun yeah. To they, yeah. You you have to capture you wanna, the Horn Eater wanna... peaks, and then you get other characters <laughs> and through the perpendicularity. Easy. Exactly. Uh, Daniel, have you played a uh, Total War Warhammer? Because that is no. Uh, that for is... some reason, it's the one that never I I never picked up. It's so good. It's it's it's. Every fantasy possible that you could possibly think of, race <laughs> thrown in. Like it's got dwarves, it's got vampires, it's got dragons, it's got dinosaurs, it's got dinosaurs riding dinosaurs fighting giant rats. It's got That's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's got four, four different types of elves. Four. Wait. Yeah. Three. Maybe. <laughs> three. A lot elves. of elves. High elves. A lot of what elves. elves? Uh, yeah. High elves, dark elves, wood elves, and then you've kind of got like dragony elves who are on the other side of the world, but they're kind of just an offshoot of high elves. You know, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, every every fantasy trope you want thrown into one big Total War game. It's mm-hmm. it's incredible. That sounds awesome. People have like modded Total War games to be like Lord of the Rings. I'm sitting here like that's fine. Give me a Cosmere though. That's what I get. Yeah. Cosmere though. <laughs> or or what if we have eventually, uh, like when it's sci-fi Cosmere, it's just like Stellaris or something, and we're going through through planets and stuff, and we. Like that would be awesome. And you could like I, I choose or my most embarrassing video. Oh, uh, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> my most embarrassing my most embarrassing video game story is Solaris. I bought it because everyone hyped it up, and I was like, I have two hours to try this out before Steam's return policies. You know, whatever. I'll try it out. And I sat there for like fifteen minutes trying to figure out how to move a ship, and I went, I'm good. And I just returned it. <laughs> I was like, uh, I can't figure out a move ship. I'm done. <laughs> I kept right clicking and like hitting WSD, and like I was like, maybe it's like the arrow keys, and I'm like, ah, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I need to give it a real go, but I was just not in the mood, so I just returned yeah. it. And when you're yeah. busy, it's yeah. just like, oh, look, I you lost me. But those big four X games are rough sometimes. Yeah. And I opened a tutorial on YouTube and I skipped like a minute in and the guy was like, then you need to take your like 40 ships over here. And then I was like, I'm tired. So, So, Daniel, this was just so much fun. Oh, Uh, yeah. I think we have to have you on after other Cosmere releases because blowing your mind with uh, a, a Cosmere thing that's great, so we, we gotta chat again. When Terra Vangian like... pulled his face off and was Vin the whole time. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what it was. That's what it was, yes. Uh, you posted the other day about your novella, and so would you like to plug your novella some more as we wrap up? It's still, draft one is being reviewed. I don't want to put the pressure and expectation that it'll be out. <laughs> it, I, I specifically put 2021, which gives me a lot of wiggle room. That's true. Um, That's smart. Yeah. So I, I have wiggle room to work with, but essentially I am making a fantasy world that is very uh, inspired by Imperial, uh, in, you know, the English Empire and America with their manifest destiny, these ideas that led to so much death. Um, and also I love the concept of what if God did just come down and start giving orders? Like, was free will's gone, right? You can't contradict God. Um, so it's kind of dealing with these ideas. And the novella is not me tackling the bigger picture. It's me saying, I'm not an experienced enough writer yet. So I'm going to take three characters who are totally unrelated. They're inspectors. And I love Sherlock types. So one of them's a Sherlock type and they're trying to solve a problem. And it's going to give a glimpse into the behind the scenes of how this empire is working that's led by a god. Um, and if you like murder, death, and snarkiness, I think it could be an interesting read. It's done, draft one. I'm very excited. 
and I have people reviewing it, and I'm hoping their response is not just don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> just, just don't. Do your, uh, I'll take your... all the criticism, but I just won't take a stop. Uh, do, your, do your inspectors all have like old-timey British accents and like mustaches? <laughs> no, uh, no, there's not that. I've, I've, actually, the aesthetic is much more. I tried to imagine what if Rome lasted to like an English Empire state where they had guns and stuff. So the architecture is very Roman. The uh, uniforms are. I, I just love that aesthetic. So I was like, I don't, I don't need logic. I'm just going to bring it in. I was like, yeah, if Robert cool. Jordan it's can fantasy. put redheads in the desert, I can bring in this <laughs> architecture and no yeah. one will be mad. Yeah. Um, I think when you read Don Shard, read Brandon's revision notes because it was it didn't quite click for me how unfinished Brandon's betas were and you can even read the beta feedback that they got uh so if a first draft isn't good like Brandon just does hey is the soul of the story here are the characters like pretty good is the overall thing good like he'll do the other stuff later so you can just iterate on it and that's yeah. that's the thing if it's that's if the first basically what my first draft is i just sprinted through it i just wrote it and that's it um i already got one feedback that's like daniel you just made a character say idk and i was like Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had someone put idk and i was like oh no so i i wrote out i don't know <laughs> that would be a stylistic choice mm-hmm. <laughs> It's, it's back in like Imperial times. He's like IDK YOLO. <laughs> that's like that's like Benny a Gideon, Gideon the Knight kind of thing you'd find. <laughs> it's like a times a mirror thing. <laughs> that, that's their salute, actually. In that world, they're just all dabs. <laughs> <laughs> These are ten out of ten ideas. Oh, that definitely don't pick any of them. Um, I will put a dab in my novella now to honor this con. No, I'm no, <laughs> Sorry, I won't, I'm no don't do that. that no, to be <laughs> no you, you, that really doesn't feel appropriate, but it would be funny at some point. Um, well, awesome. This was just so much fun. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, man, you guys got to check out Daniel's uh, YouTube mm-hmm. channel. There are a lot of great videos. Maybe I'll put in the link. He did a skit. Uh, with uh, you and your friend about how many books Brandon writes. And uh, if you haven't seen that, then that is will be very funny for you as a Brandon Sanderson reader. I can officially say it's Sanderson approved. He addressed it and said he liked it. So good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. He said it was eerily accurate. So he, he, he told a story of after he was watching it where he was like, I was on a plane and my laptop died. So I started writing on my phone and my phone died. So I started writing on the notepad. And I was like, that's the premise of the video. So apparently I made a documentary. It's a documentary. Oh, fantastic. But but usually you do you do fantasy news regularly, you do reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh and so that is what's up. And well, we hope to see you again, Daniel, cuz this is great. Hopefully. This was and, great. Absolutely. And hopefully awesome, yeah. people like that our raw file is 2 hours 6 minutes for this. <laughs> but I hope you had fun talking about uh, listening to us nerd out about fantasy and books and just things if you want shorter content watch daniel's stuff <laughs> watch yeah. daniel's stuff his stuff is not two hours generally even his author interviews minute today's video is under two minutes so yeah there you go. that's the short content you crave mm-hmm. all right guys well you can find daniel on his youtube channel links below uh and you can find us on 17shard.com for all uh news discussion and fun that you'd ever want and uh we're gonna have lots more rhythm of our podcasts of course uh mm-hmm. but yeah we will see you all next time bye bye, bye. Mm-hmm. Call. Hey. <laughs> you know what you know it's really funny um eric we were talking about we were talking about uh this Sorry, the cat is having a moment. Oh my uh, god! That's, not a cat. <laughs> that's what that was. Um, I'm like, I don't think you have kids. The last time I was like, that was a cat. <laughs> <laughs>